I moved to South Korea for university when I turned 18. I'm now 21 and this happened over two years ago. Whilst there has definitely been unwanted attention from some guys in the past, most of them get the message that I'm not interested. This however was a little more unsettling. The university I go to has an institute for language, which is where all of my classes were at the time, and it's pretty common knowledge that most foreigners in this part of Korea would know of or study at this institute. It's not abnormal for me to receive random Facebook requests from guys wanting to learn English or make foreign friends, and most of the time I just ignore them, unless we have a few mutual friends or I've met them before. I got a friend request from this guy named Nico, and we had quite a handful of mutual friends and he'd messaged me too saying he was sorry for the randomness of the request, but he was just trying to make as many foreign friends as he could. I thought, what the heck, and I accepted and messaged him back saying it was no bother. From what I could tell by his Facebook photos, he was heavily pierced and tattooed and stated he was Japanese, but had studied in Canada and could speak good English and also a foreigner studying at my university. After a few days, he messaged me again and I replied, and it was casual conversation and he would often bring up maybe meeting for coffee or a movie which I declined, until he started getting more aggressive for no reason. Every time I'd make a comment, he'd find some way to turn it into an argument, which grew tiring super fast so I just ignored him. He'd often ask if I had a boyfriend, to which I'd reply no and he'd bluntly say that we should be together. It was at this point where I decided I didn't really want anything to do with him, so I politely declined on the basis I didn't know him we'd never meet, and we hadn't even known each other a week. He didn't take my refusal well, and began throwing insults at me based on my looks and saying overly graphic things that he'd do to me if he ever saw me. Apparently I was being stupid not to take him up on the offer because I'd never do better than him and he'd make me see that. It creeped me out beyond belief, so I just blocked and deleted him on Facebook and tried to forget about it. I mentioned it to a friend of mine and she immediately knew exactly who I was talking about. Apparently I was not the first girl he added on Facebook and tried to bully into meeting him and being his girlfriend. After asking a few more of my friends who we'd had as mutual friends on Facebook, they'd all describe pretty similar situations involving this Nico. One girl even told me that she'd given him the benefit of the doubt and met with him and it turned out that he didn't even go to our university, but actually lived over an hour away and would travel there daily, probably to watch and obsess over which girl he would find on Facebook next. He told her he was born in America and had never been to Japan, yet he told me he was Japanese and studied in Canada, so who knows how much of what he said to anyone was actually true. I felt a bit freaked out by this, but tried not to let it bother me. I'd never see him around and I'd blocked him, so I forgot about it. And that was until about a week or two later I received a message from him on Facebook on another account saying how he'd see me that day at school. This shook me up a bit since I hadn't even considered that he might actually be watching me at school. I ignored the message and blocked the account. A few days later I got numerous messages from different accounts claiming to be Nico's friends, saying how he had his account hacked and could I please unblock him so he could explain and we could talk it over. I ignored these messages too, but I kept receiving more, all of which I am pretty sure were just Nico himself trying to reach out to me to get my attention. The more I ignored him, the more violent and aggressive the messages became and I could tell that most of the time when he said he'd seen me, he was lying. He'd say things like, I saw you today at the library all day, you fucking slut. You're a fucking four-eyed slut who can't get laid, and other messages to that extent. I knew he was clutching at straws because I never used the school's library to study, and although I wear glasses, I never wear them in public. So I just kept blocking the accounts and tried not to let it bother me, Figuring he was just some desperate idiot, I figured he'd get bored of me soon enough and let it go. 
until one day after classes had finished and I was browsing the small convenience store in the building to grab a drink on my way home. I opened up the fridge to get a bottle of water when I closed the door. He was literally standing right beside me. He didn't say anything, he was just staring at me. I hadn't seen him in person before because I had never agreed to meet him, but I knew straight away it was him. And I freaked out. I dropped the bottle and I just left the store. I didn't walk home because I was afraid he'd follow me and find out where I lived. So I just went back into school and stayed around areas where there were lots of people until a friend of mine came to meet me. After that, I saw him a handful of times when I'd leave class. He'd just be standing there doing nothing in particular, watching people as they walked past and he'd stare at me intently. I'd made sure to always be with friends when I went to and from class and didn't go anywhere alone for a while, but after a week or so the messages stopped and I didn't see him again. The last time I heard from him was a year ago when he messaged me on yet a new Facebook account asking if we could be friends again because he'd changed and it was all just a joke. Needless to say, I ignored the message, blocked the account and will not be taking up his offer on being friends. I dated my last serious boyfriend for around six years, and throughout the whole of those six years, I always received pokes off of a fellow on Facebook. I didn't think too much of it, and we had like 30 friends in common, so I figured maybe I had met him somewhere along the way. Besides, he was muscly and quite attractive, so having the additional attention was fun, I guess. A couple of weeks after my ex and I split, he private messaged me asking me if we could meet. We chatted for a while and I eventually agreed to go for a meal with him. On first date terms, it was a pretty lovely one. Nice meal, walk under the stars, blah blah blah. After a few weeks of seeing him, I noticed little traits in his behavior that I found to be particularly strange. He would never let me in his house and would leave me standing outside. One day I stood outside of his house for 45 minutes at 10.30pm as we had walked there. I didn't know where the hell I was and he decided that I had given him the hump for no apparent reason. This is where I should have bailed out. The following Friday, I figured I would give him the benefit of the doubt and invited him round. He stayed for nine days. I had to text a friend asking her to pick me up and not invite him just to get him out. I figured I would leave it now, until he turned up on my doorstep the next day. I told him I wasn't very well and that I had a pretty serious urinary tract infection, which was met with a lot of accusations of cheating and even being a slag. This was the final straw, and I told him to leave and not to bother contacting me. Every day I received text after text, miss call after miss call. I blocked him on Facebook, so he messaged all of my friends begging them to convince me to take him back. Hell no. I figured that after some time, he would back away. Things went quiet for about a week. It was bliss until I received a call off a number I didn't know. It was asking me who the man was who had just walked in front of my door. It was my father, by the way. This happened every time someone walked in front of my flat. Male, female, it didn't matter. Turned out he knew someone who lived across the street from me and had him and his lovely girlfriend watching my every move. Things calmed down again after speaking to the couple and explaining the grief it had caused me. He told them that he was still together with me and he was concerned for my safety. And I thought he had got the message until one day when I finished work and caught the bus home. I had this perfectly timed so that I would always be pulling up to my estate at 6pm. As I strolled down the hill to my estate, ready to cut through the alley towards the garages, I noticed a figure tucked away in the shadows in the corner. It was him. I kept my head up and marched onwards to my front door. He followed the distance behind until I reached the door and ran after me and chased me up the stairs in the block of flats I lived in. I told him I wasn't interested, that he was scaring me and that he needed help. And this is where he thought that maybe a hug 
would change my mind in this situation. After letting out a massive scream from my neighbor, he was escorted out of the building and was told that if he returned, it probably would be the last thing he had ever done. At least I have learned now not to date people off of Facebook and at least run a background check on any future partners. I'm a 22 year old female and I'm finishing up my first college degree this summer. So I take mainly online classes as I work and volunteer a lot. However, this semester I only had two science classes left in order to graduate and one of the classes I needed was only offered on campus. Ugh. It's a twice a week class and each class runs roughly two hours, but the teacher usually lets us go after about 45 to 60 minutes. I live kind of far from the campus so I usually walk in about 50 minutes late and therefore never get called for attendance. The teacher knows my situation and I just have to let him know that I'm there before I leave class and we're good. I know this may not seem important but I promise it is. So my class has a test on this upcoming week. The teacher gives us study guides that are pretty similar to the actual test questions but they aren't like required to pass the test or anything. A lot of it is common sense. So today I am hanging out at my coworker's house when my phone goes off. I checked it and saw I had a Facebook message from a person I didn't recognize. So I opened the message. It was not a name I had ever heard or remember hearing. It's a pretty unique name, so I was sort of confused. The message read, Hey, I am in your intro to science class. I really need a study guide and would drive to your house if it meant accessing it. So immediately I'm a little weirded out because I literally have no idea who this guy is. I don't recognize him from the class and I certainly don't recognize his name. Not to mention, like I said earlier, I am literally never there for attendance so it couldn't be easily explained as like he saw me answer for my name or anything. So then I'm thinking maybe he looked at the class roster online and messaged a bunch of people. So I texted a few of my classmates to see if they had heard from this guy and they all said no and asked why I wanted to know. I explained the situation to them and they verified they didn't recognize the guy's name or face and they're good students who actually show up to class on time. So I didn't message the guy back obviously and he messaged me again a few hours later saying, Come on, I know you read this. And now I am even more creeped out. The teacher has been offering the study guide for like two weeks in class, so I really don't understand why he wouldn't have a copy. Not to mention, he could have contacted the teacher for a copy as we still have several days until the test. If he looked up the roster online, why would he have only messaged me and not my other classmates? Maybe I'm overreacting, but I feel like it's super creepy. I'm a 20-something woman, American and a Francophile, fluent but not native in French. Since 2011, I've been in correspondence with an eccentric French guy I met because he posted a clip of a super rare telefilm on YouTube. We had a bunch of mutual interests and eventually met in real life so he could give me the movie on a flash drive. He also gifted me a book from his personal library that he thought I would like. We stayed in contact and I recently returned the favor by buying him a DVD off Amazon. It's been good. Our conversations are enriching and he's a sweet guy, just odd, as am I. He sort of switches between identities online, his real name, Jean and then an Italian surname, and a fictional character from gothic literature. He's very into dark romanticism. I knew him on Facebook under the name of the character, and for a while that was his email address as well, although last summer he started using an address based off his real name, so it was kind of a mix of the two. He can be hard to keep tabs on because he often disappears from Facebook without warning and then reappears as soon as he came. He's gone through two or three different accounts, all using the fictional character's name. It wasn't a surprise when he vanished sometime last fall and I just kept my eyes peeled for him. Occasionally I do a search and one day I found an account with his real name, although not one with the fictional character. There was no face pic, 
but that was typical. Since he sometimes uses his real name online as well, I added that person, figuring if he wasn't the right person he would just decline my request slash send me a message asking how we knew each other. When he accepted my request without asking me who I was, I figured it was him. This seemed to be confirmed when I first started messaging him in late February. Between then and now we've exchanged just over 900 messages. I started things where they had left off, saying how it was good to see him back. I had just been thinking of him. I was going to email him something but now I could do it over Facebook chat, etc. He greeted me warmly and then when I sent him a YouTube video I thought he'd like, he proceeded to discuss it with me. He was a little less articulate than I remembered, but not so much that it became noticeable except in hindsight. I think the incoherence isn't quite as glaring to me in French as well since it's not my native language. And he was odd, but that was normal. In April he returned to Facebook under the fictional character's name. We added each other and started Facebook chatting. I would chat with the two accounts indiscriminately. They were never online at the same time, so I would just talk to whichever one was on. Again, I noticed that something was off with John. He would say things that didn't make sense and then refuse to explain when I said I was confused. He would use flirtatious terms of endearment, which made me uncomfortable. He made a lot of typos that made it hard to follow him too. It was only later that I noticed all the typos, all the cryptic statements and non sequiturs, all the flirtation happened when I was talking to Jean and not when I was talking to the account with the name of the fictional character. Likewise, all the most legit stuff happened with the fictional character account, like me getting his address to send him the DVD. He was just straight up nicer on that account too. I had some unpleasant arguments with real name Jean and only him. I didn't notice that at the time though, because there otherwise seemed to be a continuity between the two accounts. We discussed the same topics on both, and while the speech patterns were somewhat different, like I said, more lucid and friendly on the fictional character account, there were also notable similarities. The same Italian expressions got used, for instance. Real name Jean called me Bella Ragazza, a flirtatious gesture that made me slightly uncomfortable. Fictional character Jean, while making fun of a Roberto Alagna album cover, called him Bel Oyomo. They both used the expression no problemo at various points. They both complained about the French far right. It seemed seamless. Until it wasn't. On Saturday I saw a real name Jean online and started chatting with him, asking him if he heard about all the stuff that had happened that week in the US. When I brought up marriage equality, he became very homophobic, which surprised me because I had known him to be a decent guy. We'd argued about non-binary gender before, but straight up vicious homophobia, slurs, etc., and it came as a shock to me. I started to fight with him and he became very hostile, saying nonsensical and paranoid things like, if I come to your city, you'll hide with your friends so as not to show your face at the supermarket and telling me to stop talking to him. None of this made any sense to me given our four year history, his past affectionate behavior, etc. And I asked him, so we're not friends anymore? Trying to figure out what the hell was going on. He responded that friendship means nothing on the internet, which I found bizarre because we met in real life in the summer of 2011 and had been planning to meet again last year, except that he had been out of town. A while later, I saw that fictional character Jean had liked and commented on one of my photos. Another thing I only realized in hindsight was that all the likes and comments were from fictional character Jean, not real name Jean. I went to Facebook chat, only real name Jean was on. I asked him why he was liking my stuff when he told me to stop talking to him. Furious, he responded that he hadn't liked anything. Where do you see my name? I said. Well, not your real name fictional character. He said, so? And told me to fuck off. At this point, I was reeling in confusion. What the fuck was happening? Was he having a dissociative episode? I resolved to talk to real name Jean when he came online to see how he acted towards me, and if he was civil, to confront him with his behavior under his other account. 
He came on early in the morning, and I rushed to talk to him, both deeply unsettled and dying of curiosity. Hi, can I talk to you? It's kind of urgent, I said. Him? Urgent? Sure, what's up? So when I was talking to real name Jean, you're the only one I'm talking to, right? This man is you, and I linked to the Facebook page, to which he responded, Not at all. In fact, I don't have a Facebook account under my real name. This person is simply homonymous. He confirmed that he only been back on Facebook since April, the time when the fictional character account reappeared. He was pretty distressed to learn I'd been talking to this guy for four months thinking it was him, and even more distressed to know that the guy was a dick, and I thought even for a moment that he also was a dick. You're probably wondering how it took me so long to figure it out, and all I can say is that because I took for granted the real name Jean and fictional character Jean were the same person, it never even occurred to me that they might not be. Them being the same person was the null hypothesis and the idea that they might not be, that real name Jean might be pretending, was so incredibly crackers that it never crossed my mind, not once. You're probably still wondering how I could simply have taken for granted that real name Jean was my friend when he gave so many hints that he wasn't, and I have to remind you the degree to which he simply went along with everything I said. I would talk about stuff specific to my friend, stuff that must not have made any sense to the man I will now call fake Sean, and he would act like he knew what I was talking about. The idea that he was lying, faking, or delusional was unthinkably bizarre. Today after I walked home from school, I changed into my PJs and browse let's not meet, just like I do every single other day. Well, about an hour later, I get a message on Facebook from a weird account telling me to go outside. After investigating, I realized he messaged me before only saying hi, so half asleep stupid me figures, why not? I'm not home alone, nothing will happen, right? Wrong. I go outside and see a tall guy with long hair and a Children of Bodom shirt on. I love Children of Bodom, so I figured he used to go to my school but graduated since he didn't look that much older than me. He looked really happy to see me, so I figured I did know him, but I don't remember him. I have very bad memory, so I gave him a quick hug, but he hugged me a little longer than expected. Okay, I said to myself, kind of weird, but not really. Oh my god, you're so beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. I was scared your Facebook pictures were going to be filtered. What the fuck? Around there I realized I had no idea who this guy was, but he kept a firm grip on my hand. Come to my car, it's over there. He pointed to a little broken down red car at the end of my block. No, I have to take care of my sisters, I said. I was completely alone. Come on, just for a while. He started pulling my arm, and my alarm bells were screaming. No, I have to go. I pulled free and quickly turned to my house when he grabbed my wrist. He mumbled something, then grabbed my ass in a very tight grip. I'm 5'3", and he was like 6-something, so he was hovering over me. Let me lick your asshole. What the fuck? I guess it was the fight or flight response that kicked in, and I just squirmed until I broke loose. He grabbed my face and tried to kiss me, but I lightly punched his shoulder and told him to get the fuck away. Thankfully my neighbor from across the street saw everything and started screaming at him. He let me go and bolted to his car and sped off. My neighbor came over to me and asked me if I was okay and walked to my house and got me water and called the police. All we could provide is a small red Honda with a tall male with a COB shirt and long hair. They told me they'd call me if they found him to let me know I'm safe, yet they haven't called. I'm still scared, and I'm still grateful my neighbor was home early, and I still have my sanity. I haven't had a lot of creepy things happen to me. But reading a few stories here reminds me of this event that happened just over a month ago. 
I sometimes receive random Facebook requests and my general rule is to never accept a request from a stranger. Anyway, this random guy sends me a request and I already know we have never met, but curiosity got the better of me and I decide to skim over his profile. No big deal. As I'm scrolling down his main feed, I see my name pop up in a seemingly normal status. In that moment, I was quite taken aback. It was my full name, and although it's rather average, I know no one with it. Creepy, yes, but maybe it is just a coincidence, so I continue. Eventually, I come across another status describing how he'd like to be with a girl with my exact features, which include eyes, hair color, and skin color. Next, I find a fabricated text message conversation that made it look like I was involved with this guy. I also found a few statuses about romantic activities we shared that never actually happened. Of course, I nope the fuck out of there but not before taking a few screenshots and blocking them. This person does live a few states over from me in another large city, but I keep my social profiles to private so hopefully he doesn't contact me again. I realize now that I probably should have also reported the guy, but I honestly didn't want to provoke any kind of responses from him whatsoever. A little background. This guy added me on Facebook out of the blue when I was like 13. I'm 16 now. When I asked him who he was, he told me he saw my profile picture and thought I was beautiful and all that bullshit. Fast forward a year after we've been talking and he tries hooking me up with one of his friends because you're so beautiful and he just has to have you. I declined several times because I had a boyfriend. When I posted a picture of us later, him and his friends started saying so many awful things to me in the comments section. After blocking all of them is when things got really creepy. They sent Google map photos of my house. I had never given them my address and kept the location thing off at all times, and the guy I originally met threatened to cut my heart out. I blocked him and reported him. The next year he admits his undying love for me. He refuses to leave me alone. I finally just got rid of my Facebook and plan on making a new one. So, creepy guy from India, let's not meet. I'm an uninteresting man in my late 20s with a stable job and happy family. Being so, I had never even entertained the thought that I might, one day, be the target of a stalker. So here's my story as a warning to everyone. You don't have to be a typical, pretty young lady to catch the eye of a stalker. I don't know if this makes sense, but I am a habitual yet very casual Facebook user. I don't post a lot, but I do check my news feed often. One Saturday night I was doing a quick round on Facebook before I went to bed when I received a friend request. I accepted it without hesitation. Just about every friend request I receive gets accepted because I don't ever post anything very personal. As I said, I have a very casual approach to social networking. I do a quick glance on the profile that had friended me and saw that it was an obviously fake account. Not thinking much of it, I put my computer away and fell asleep. The next day, I was having lunch at a friend's house having completely forgotten about the friend request from the night before. My phone buzzed and I saw that I had gotten a message from a co-worker of mine, Maya. Although Maya and I worked together and had a few mutual friends outside of work, we didn't communicate much other than when it was about work. I checked it, assuming it was work-related. I guess looking back you can say it was. To get the gist of it, the Facebook account that friended me also friended Maya and had bombarded her with insults and accusations of being a whore, slut, and every name in the book. The person took it a step further by messaging Maya's husband, saying that she was cheating on him with a co-worker. Maya wanted to know if I knew who the person was, because I was the only other person that accepted the friend request. I explained to her how I accept every request and have no idea who it was. 
I then proceeded to unfriend the profile in question. Maya explained to me that she already had suspicions on who it was, but just wanted to see if I could confirm it. She believed it was Carrie. Let's rewind to a few weeks earlier. I had received a friend request from Carrie. It struck me as odd because, although we worked at the same place, we had never met, never spoken, nor had we ever made eye contact or been within 20 feet of each other. We worked in different departments, but I walked past her every day because I had to walk through her department to get to our lounge. That was the furthest extent of our interactions. I only learned her name from when she friended me on Facebook and I recognized her picture. I'm not sure how she found out my name. Carrie also friended my wife's profile and subsequently began to sift through years of my wife's posts and pictures, liking and commenting on several of them. She began interacting with my posts too, as though she knew us as well. At work though, I'd walk by like usual and still no interaction. I found it odd but didn't look too far into it. So back to the present, the mysterious Facebook account continued to harass Maya until she told her that she knew it was Carrie and was going to call the police. I thought that was the end of that but boy was I wrong. Over several weeks I began getting more friend requests from girls looking to hook up with me. Obviously I knew they were all fake and for the most part I ignored them. I also began getting notifications from Google and Facebook accounts about suspicious activity on my profile. Most of the time it warned me of failed login attempts. One I specifically remember said my Facebook account was actually logged in from somewhere unusual and asked whether it was me. It wasn't me and I should have been more concerned but for some reason I didn't care at the time. I was stupid and even after that I didn't bother to change my password. At the time I viewed all of these happenings as random isolated incidents. I had no valuable stuff on my account and didn't have any private secretive messages. What harm could they do right? A few months pass when one day my wife gets a message from Carrie stating that she had bought a high-end video camera and was looking to start some amateur filming. She wanted to know if we could help her by letting her film our family for a day. Remembering what Maya had said a few months ago, I was reluctant but wanted to give Carrie the benefit of the doubt so we agreed to tell her that we'd schedule a time for her whenever we weren't busy and left it at that. Once again, I have yet to actually meet Carrie. More weeks pass by and we completely forget about scheduling the film shoot when Carrie messages me about it. I turn her down. Then things got weird. She sent several GIF files of stick figures doing sexually suggestive motions and gyrations. I didn't respond so she asked, funny isn't it? I immediately texted my wife to log into my Facebook profile to observe the messages. Not wanting to be rude, I agreed with Carrie as of the humor in the GIFs she sent and carried on the conversation. She proceeded to send me old photos from my abandoned MySpace account that I had completely forgotten about. That was around the time when MySpace had been revamped and people lost a lot of cherished memories. Somehow she dug mine up and decided to share them with me. It was creepy to me. Things escalated quickly from there. She began talking about her body and how she wasn't attractive, trying to bait me into complimenting her looks. She was not beautiful but she was an attractive person. I didn't bite though. Then she hit me with something out of the blue. She asked me about my penis, calling it my cock and suggesting that it was probably pretty big. I decided that was enough and stopped responding. Of course my wife was reading the whole time and we were texting back and forth about how funny and weird this all was. I continued to go to work and still awkwardly never actually met Carrie. I especially didn't want to strike up any conversations after that. Carrie messaged me one final time asking for a favor. Maya had blocked her profile and Carrie suspected that Maya was saying bad stuff about her so she wanted me to check her profile to confirm. I told her that I wasn't going to stalk Maya for her and that was that. Just between us though. I did check and no, 
Maya couldn't care less to waste her time talking about Carrie. Around this time, my wife got a text from an unknown number. The person knew her name but was trying to remain anonymous and was trying to flirt with her. We were with a bunch of friends at the time and we all thought it'd be funny if we all text flirted with this person at the same time to annoy them. Once again, I never thought to connect any of the incidents. Carrie eventually quit work and I never saw her again, but I continued to get suspicious activity and friend requests that I, stupidly, continued to write off. I had all but forgotten about Carrie. Then, I'd say over a year later, I get a bomb from my wife. A good friend of ours texted her that I was sending her very inappropriate messages on Facebook. I had been busy running errands all day and hadn't really checked my Facebook at the time. I found that my password had been changed when I finally logged back on. All of my messages had also been cleared. I had no idea the extent of what happened until I started hearing from people that I was being very suggestive and nasty to them. The thing was, these weren't random women on my friends list that were targeted. These were women that were close to me, good friends, my wife's sisters, my friend's wives. These messages weren't holding back either. They went all out in graphic detail about what I wanted to do to them. I felt completely violated and humiliated. I couldn't imagine how the women felt. My wife and I were really close to our families and friends and every other week or so, all of our friends would get together and drink, BBQ, watch movies or sports and hang out. We'd seen several families over and never had a problem. All of them said they understood what happened and that they know it wasn't me. Deep inside though, I could see that they felt that it possibly, potentially, probably was me. Over time, more and more of them stopped coming over to the point where my home started to feel empty. I confided in my wife how I felt that they think it was me and she rebutted that I was just being paranoid. She argued that our friends were just busy with their lives that they'd eventually come over when they were free again. I then learned that someone had created a Facebook account using my name and picture and had continued harassing the same women. One of them posted a picture of the conversation with this false me on Facebook. She commented that it could really be me because that mystery person has used some words that I typically would. She also stated that the person knew my friends and family extensively. My heart instantly shattered reading that. I quit checking my Facebook for the longest time, and I guess I fell into a mild depression. I felt miserable. I told my wife that I wanted to disappear and strongly considered quitting my job of seven years and moving away to start anew. I now know that I was being quite irrational, and thankfully my wife stayed strong for me through it all. I felt like I needed to defend my honor and started gathering alibis of times, people, and places I was around during the time of many of those messages. My wife brutally told me that she couldn't believe I was weak enough to let a no-life dumbass on Facebook put me down and make me feel that way. Which is true. I am and always have been a very mentally strong person. I always look for the best in a bad situation but for some reason this affected me differently. I can't explain why, but I felt extreme shame and guilt for something I didn't even do. Without my wife's support knocking me back to reality, I don't know what would have happened. We advised our friends just to ignore the person and eventually everything stopped. From time to time I still get a random friend request, but I don't accept them anymore. I don't have any proof that this was all the work of Carrie. It just all happened during a time when she injected herself into my life and eventually stopped after she left. My friends have started coming over again, but it hasn't felt the same ever since then. I don't know if it's them or just in my head. My wife and I came to the conclusion that Carrie reveled in the misery of others. After tormenting Maya, she moved on and targeted me trying to ruin my marriage and distance me from friends for no other reason than the fact that she enjoyed doing so. I'm sure she hasn't stopped and only left me alone because she found a new victim to harass.
It was the night of prom and me and about five other girls, all around the ages of 17 to 18, pretty much all black, had left the venue and were driving around aimlessly, hoping to catch a party to go to. Every place we went to ended up being a bust or getting busted by cops, so we were headed to go hang out with some friends around 2 to 3 a.m. It's important to note that none of us were inebriated in any manner. So by this time of the night, the roads were almost completely empty. We live in rural, suburban northern Virginia, and it's incredibly dark as the car has broken high beams. The driver, Key, made a turn down a road and, seeing as it was incredibly dark, briefly drove in the wrong lane. No divider. It only lasted around five seconds or so, and absolutely no one was on the street, so she just calmly corrected herself. Right as she makes it to the correct lane, a car about 50 to 100 feet behind us turns on his headlights and lays on the horn. It seemed like this guy appeared out of nowhere, and I found it incredibly strange he didn't have his headlights on as it was a new moon and almost completely dark. So she waves her hand out the window and says sorry, but the guy was just not having it. He immediately sped up, riding on our tail and honking almost constantly to the point we were going around 60 in a 30 zone. He was in a huge black truck waving a confederate flag out of the back and we were in a tiny green Kia so we were understandably terrified. He even ended up actually ramming our bumper a few times, although not enough to dent the car or move it thankfully. We were debating what to do, whether we should call the cops or not, when Key takes a few sharp turns and ends up losing the guy to stop in a parking lot. We wait super quietly under this shady tree, ready to drive off or call the police or both for a few minutes. One of my friends suddenly notices his truck parked in a few parking lots away, separated by a few trees in a way that we can see him, but we were hoping he couldn't see us. I don't have the best eyesight, but even I could see him jump out of the car. This guy was massive, wide and tall, holding something in his arms and waving it around. Another friend with more gun experience than I points out it looks like it could be a shotgun. We watch for a few seconds, paralyzed in fear as he yells something along the lines of, Y'all Negroes need to come out! After we all wisened up, Key put the car into drive and sped out of that parking lot as fast as she could. We were visibly shaken and immediately went home so we could safely freak the fuck out, making sure to see if he was following us the whole way home. At 14 I moved in with my estranged father in a rural town in the USA. I found myself, a former city kid, living in a farmhouse on a plot of land that was a half a mile from the main road, surrounded by acres of forest on all sides. It was lonely and isolated. A few handymen, who I assumed were buddies of my father's or something, were working on various projects around the property. One guy named Dan was being paid a few hundred dollars to dig a very large hole for some kind of plumbing issue behind the house. One evening while my father was away on a business trip to the city, Dan rolled up in his truck. That's a bit odd, but he probably made a scheduling error. I met him at the door to tell him that my dad wasn't home and to try back tomorrow. My father had a very strict rule that guys who worked on the property had to call him first before coming around. They were never supposed to show up unannounced. When I told him my father wasn't home, I was sure he would leave immediately. Instead, the expression on his face changed. Suddenly he perked up and smiled. He had very dark brown eyes that were set close together and he stared with purpose. In hindsight, I'd say his stare was predatory. Also looking back, I'm fairly embarrassed by how naive and silly my answers to his questions were. I guess at 14 I was still trying hard to fit in and was excessively polite. There was a screen door between us and he reached out and opened it so that he was holding the door in one hand while he talked to me. He started asking how I liked living in the area, and then he asked how I liked high school. I politely told him that everything was going well so far. 
Are you going to the prom? He asked. I had noticed around this time why his smile and dark stare was starting to bother me. There was something very deliberate, almost practiced about his questions, as if they were just all part of some memorized script. The wide smirk on his face never went away. I'm sure someone has asked you to the prom, he said. Uh, I don't think so. I'm just a sophomore. But I'm allowed to go if I go with an older student, I told him. I bet you have lots of boyfriends, right? No, I just moved here. He didn't pick up the obvious social cues I was sending him to leave me alone. I felt that sickness in my stomach, the nauseating and overwhelming sensation of terror. Despite keeping my cool, my mind began to spin crazy theories at me. What would I do if he planned on raping me? I was so far away from civilization, no one would hear me if I screamed at the top of my lungs. My mind raced through all the angles, the possibilities, the skills I should employ in this situation. I can be your boyfriend, he said, still smirking, and again, I'd like to take you to prom. I laughed a bit. Um, no thanks? He took a step closer, as if he was just about to step right over me and inside the house. What are you, about 16? He was now looking me over, and I mean looking me over. His eyes traced me up and down. It felt as if his gaze had left a slime trail across my body. Not yet. I'm turning 15, I answered, at this point hoping he'd go away when he found out how young I really was. Oh, that's okay, he assures me. I like younger girls. I've had a lot of girlfriends who were your age. Are you sure you're not 16? You look really mature for your age. Yeah, I'm sure, I said, still laughing off his comments while feeling absolutely trapped. Look, I think you should go, because my dad could come home at any minute and you know, he hates when people show up unannounced, and he especially doesn't like visitors after he's been on the road all day. You know how pissed he gets about it. He shrugged. Oh, it's okay. I talked to him yesterday told him I'd be coming by to finish up the job, and he said he'd be home a little late. We can wait for him together, talk some more. While he never said that he wanted me to invite him in the house, everything about his body language and gaze indicated that he expected me to ask him to step inside. He was practically leaning right through the door frame. There was no way I was going to let him in, even though looking back that wouldn't have really mattered. It didn't immediately hit me, what he had just said and what it implied. He said that he had talked to my father and known he wouldn't be home until late. So what the fuck was he doing here? He went on more about how he would take me to the prom and how he would pay for it and treat me nice. What a nice girl I was, how beautiful young girls like me are at this age. And there was no lock on that screen door. And the wooden door was warped and had a clunky lock that took a while and a bit of a shoving to engage so I just stood there and listened to this pervert. He presses again. Do you want a boyfriend? No. Look, I don't date guys who are... older. Just high school boys. It would be really weird if someone your age went to the prom. I should explain. He looked about 45. You shouldn't say that. He smiles. Age doesn't matter. I've been with lots of teenagers. Some girls are very experienced sexually before they're 16. You seem like you've already had a lot of experiences to me. You're one of those types who is a grown woman in a younger woman's body, right? I don't quite remember all of my dumb responses to him, but I remember very clearly his pressing to the point that age is just a number and that young girls were sexual goddesses, that older women were bitter and angry and he loved how happy and self-assured young teen girls were. I clearly remember he said, You don't have to decide whether you want to go to the prom with me right away. Let's hang out a bit first and get to know each other. 
I finally said something to the effect of, I'm going back inside now. Have a good night. I'm probably going to call my dad to find out when he's coming home. There was no way that was possible. This was before cell phones were very common and I had no idea where my father was at that moment. He took my hand and kissed it right between my first and second knuckles. I wanted to vomit. He said, Okay, I'll be going. I hope to see you soon, princess. Princess. I withdrew inside the house, relieved he was going. I watched him walk down to his truck in the driveway, started up and back out of our driveway, so I didn't bother trying to lock the door. Instead, I went to my room on the second floor. My window looked out upon a small stretch of dirt road that led to the main road. The truck, a white pickup, exited the driveway but pulled over further back on the road. I could see the tail end of it. It remained parked there without the lights on. I was confused. He had pulled out, then pulled to the side of the dirt road beside some bushes. But from that second floor window, I could clearly see that he had gone no more than 50 feet from the driveway. The truck remained there for about 20 minutes. I like to think that he wasn't trying to hide his truck from me, but I had been on the first floor. It would have appeared that he had driven away. When my father came home later that night, I told him about Dan's visit. My father wasn't outraged on my behalf, perhaps sort of bemused. He was more pissed about Dan being around the house at all. He said, I fired him last week. He knows better than to be around here, and he should be calling first. So my father called up Dan and cursed him out for coming to the house when he had been specifically told not to return, threatening him with physical violence if he ever showed up on his property again. He added, and don't talk to my daughter while she's here alone. You scared her. I learned later why my father had a rule about the guys who worked on the property and why they always had to call first before coming over. He was mainly worried that they'd rob him because the guys he'd hire were all ex-cons who charged a discounted under-the-table rate. Most of them, including Dan, were on parole for violent crimes and had very few job prospects elsewhere. Dan had recently been released from prison and my father didn't trust him. I don't know what his crimes were, but I can take a guess. I heard he returned to prison about a year later. In my senior year, I was the battalion commander of my AJ ROTC unit. This means I pretty much knew every single cadet whether I wanted to or not. In my class, there was one individual who was a sophomore and 18 years old. He never bathed and always smelled awful, so needless to say, I never got close enough to have a conversation. About a month before senior prom, I was without a date and very angry. My mother's friend had a son that was in my grade level, and although we hated each other, I ended up taking him to prom. That night, as soon as we stepped to the door, he ditched me, which was fine. I worked the room and danced with some friends, but when slow dances started, I was all alone. I started moving back to the lobby area where I bumped into this cadet from my class, John. John was in a very nice tuxedo, smelled like a flower bed and had a very cute smile. I told him that he looked great and we started talking as we had really never had a conversation before. The second slow dance was starting and he asked me to dance, but my date was anxious to leave. I gave John my number right in front of my date and told him to text me. In the weeks that followed, John did text me. A lot. At first he would tell me I was pretty and all that, and I ate it up. But then it started getting weird. John would ask me very invasive questions about my sex life and sexual partners. When I told him that I was a virgin, he told me that that made him so happy. I started getting the creepy vibes from him so I told him he needed to back off a little. He didn't, so the next day in class I looked him directly in the eyes and told him to back off. He looked sad, said he understood, and then asked for a hug. I just walked away. Fast forward a few weeks, he continues to text me and I continue to ignore him. One night after graduation, 
I'm laying on my bed playing a game. I get a text, see that it's him and after reading it, so I wouldn't keep getting notifications, I ignored it. I get another text from him shortly after that says, Hey, I can see your house, which window is yours? I immediately bolt up and close my blinds. I call him and scream at him that if he isn't gone in five minutes, I will call the cops. He didn't leave, and after that I blocked his number and told him that any further contact would be reported to an authority figure immediately. Thankfully, that was the end of that. He still occasionally tries to friend me on Facebook, but I never accept it. So in 2013, we had our annual prom night for the Leavers Day, which was a big thing for our school. The UK has now become a mini version of the USA. All was good. No drinking, but we were having a great time, and me and my five friends were looking forward to the free house and loved the idea of the freedom that night would bring after prom. We brought booze, played FIFA, and just had a good time up until around 2 a.m., at this point I'm beginning to feel the effects of the alcohol, and as tradition, we would always go for a late night slash early morning walk just to catch a breath of fresh air and explore creepy places. We always did this and nothing seemed odd, but this one time it didn't feel right. My good friend suggested we go for another famous walk, and everyone agreed except for me and my other good friend. We were the most drunk and felt like sleeping. But after being peer pressured into going, we hit the streets, laughing and being teens. Now where we lived was an ex-mining town that hit a huge recession during the time the mines were shut down. But when the economy crashed around 2008, many people became jobless, so it wasn't uncommon to see derelict houses and junkies wandering around the back alleys. For some reason though, it didn't feel right. I had this feeling that shit was going to hit the fan. We walked to the outskirts for around 10 minutes, and with it being summer, the air was humid yet slightly breezy. Me and my friend Mark were lagging behind, barely seeing straight when a black car drove past. Again, not uncommon as people work nights, except a bunch of clearly stoned, angry-looking men began screaming at us. We left and carried on, but they came back. So me being the confident, brainless idiot I was when under the influence, I flipped them off and shouted, Fuck you! To which everyone laughed and followed suit. Next thing we were all swearing at them, trying to look cool and looking back on it, we were giving them the reaction they clearly wanted. As the car continued down the road, I kid you not, the car did a full 80 handbrake skid and began racing towards us. We bricked it and hightailed it out of there into a council estate as we ducked behind some cars, discussing our plan of action. By this point we were being circled when the car stops dead in front of the parked car we were behind. We were all pretty big lads for early 16 year olds, and we were reaching the 6 foot barrier, but even I'll admit, we all got frightfully teary eyed and our hearts sank as a chilling voice shouted, You better run if you want to see tomorrow. Of course we did, and in the moment of panic you tend to look for the nearest escape. So I did and followed, running as fast as I could, still keeping pace, even though I'm so drunk I'm seeing double before managing to split up in different directions. I followed two others into an alley, and the others darted towards the road which led to the next town over. Not the best place to go since it's mostly wooded areas and an old reservoir. My other buddy then, after some time to calm down, bravely went out onto the street acting drunk and confused and told them he had seen some lads running towards a subway further down the road, and no sooner had they pulled off in pursuit he shouted to us, You two wait there, and legged it back to my place to get help, only to realize no one was in because all our parents had gone out together. He was the oldest so we trusted him the most, and he instead began to give us courage calm us down and guide us to safer places over the phone while me and my other friend ducked in an alley as we were circled by a car full of lads banging on the door chanting and screaming shit like, when we find you we're gonna stab you. 
I at that point feared for my life. Imagine being in an alleyway while some madmen circle you in their car, clearly wanting to cause damage. We were surrounded by houses, so why we didn't just knock on the door I don't know, but we knew no one would help us at 2.30 in the morning, and I felt incredibly alone. I began throwing up, and no sooner had I puked, my friend grabbed me and literally picked me up over his shoulder and dove into the bush behind us as we watched the car roll by slowly, the passenger hanging out the door with a knife clutched. Scariest moment of my life, but thank God my friend who risked himself for me and didn't just leave me to take the shit. I still owe him for that. After meeting up with another friend across the street, we tracked ourselves like militants across the town until I received a phone call from my friend who we had lost. He was all alone on the other side of town and told me in a sobbing voice that they were right in front of him and that although they couldn't see him, he was concerned and explained that they were talking about how they were going to hunt us down. We sent Kyle, the friend we had just met up with again to go and find him, leaving me and Mac all alone again. Thank God Kyle found him and both made it out and back to Mark where they would be waiting anxiously. But of course, me and my friend Mac were still a good 15 minutes from home and although the town was small, home is a long way when you're being hunted by fully grown men. For the next hour we hid on tennis courts, commando crawled through the undergrowth while staying on the phone to my already safe friends, but what chilled me the most was the sound of a constant echo of a wheel-spinning car running at high revs as it circled around us on the surrounding roads and streets for almost two hours. Two hours they were looking for us, which indicates they had bad intentions. We ounced up our courage and ran as fast as we could home, and finally we made it there and were greeted by the rest of the gang who had calmly waited in the backyard, and as corny as it sounds, we all just hugged it out and breathed a sigh of relief as we made sense of what had just happened and how we could have died or been seriously injured. We didn't sleep at all that night and instead discussed our individual thoughts and point of views on what had happened. We still talk about it today, but a few days after the incident it was evening and I was walking back with my friend Mark, the one who actually tricked them into going so that he could escape. We were just walking back to his house drinking Mountain Dew, discussing life when the same car eerily drives past, full of three scruffy looking guys staring at us. A dark side street behind a supermarket and the same car happens to roll by again. I double checked the plates and it confirmed it was the car. I have a good memory and the plates were a very distinctive custom plates. We stared back and they just smiled and pulled off. Needless to say, we got out of there and got back home. But even now, when I hear a car wheel spinning or a sports engine revving in the distance, it brings back memories of that night. This goes back to 2002. I was a senior in high school and prom was right around the corner. I was single at the time, but kind of on off again, off again with a gal. She asked if I'd like to take her to the prom and I said yeah, sure why not. The week before of course she cancelled. She wasn't going and didn't want to have to mess with it all. Whatever. Most of my friends except two were going and one wasn't even from the same school district in fact. Comes that day and I was kind of bummed out, even if not initially. So I meet up with these two guys, Dave and Jake, that evening. Jake somehow managed to get a 12-pack of Bush and a bottle of vodka despite being 18. The plan was to take Dave's car and go cruising, find a party to crash after the prom and get tore up. I didn't really drink heavily and still don't, but was feeling pretty shitty and didn't even care. We stopped by Dave's sister's house to get a CD, a misfit CD. Jake and I wait in the car while Dave's rummaging through the house. While in the car shooting the shit, Jake gets a call on his phone from our buddy Mark from school. Apparently some guy or guys had been trying to put the moves on the gal he was taking to prom and he stepped in to say something about it outside and took a punch to the eye. Now, Mark is a nice guy. 
He's pretty passive but looks like trouble. He wore a short mohawk and looked almost just like Heroin Bob from SLC Punk. This isn't the type of thing that usually goes on in his life. It was, however, in mine. I got into a lot of pretty stupid fights in high school. Apparently these guys, three of them told him if he wanted to talk about it further to meet them behind the school. So he's calling us. He doesn't want to look like a pussy in front of this girl and needs a hand. We got nothing better to do so we make the decision for Dave before he has the chance to agree or object. Dave didn't seem to mind one way or another. We all kind of honestly thought if we showed up outnumbering them, they'd just back down anyway. So we get there, meet up with Mark, who's pacing around outside smoking a cigarette. Rather than waste time, we just agree to get this over with and go around behind the school. Unsurprisingly, given the events, it's crowded as hell even behind the school. People are standing around smoking, making out, puking, etc. Off to the left across the parking lot is a fairly narrow alley leading behind an office building and a church. Mark suggests they're probably there if they're still here at all. We agree and casually stroll into the alley. Mark's leading the way, all decked out for prom in a goddamn tuxedo even. Now to frame this part here even more accurately, this alley is narrow enough that all four of us can't stand shoulder to shoulder in it. Only three of us can fit at once, so we had Dave behind us. Mark wastes no time and yells, Hey assholes, I'm back, as we're entering the alley. He didn't need to though, there was no way in hell they wouldn't have noticed us coming in. It doesn't take long, there's no squaring up. No shit being flung, it just starts. A scuffle. It's dark in the alley with only the light from the parking lot behind us spilling in. It's a tight fit with even three people in here, and there are a total of seven of us all together swinging at each other, cussing all the way and a bottle breaks somewhere along the way that, at the time, I remember thinking one of them threw at us. In short, it's utter chaos in the alley. It's hard to even discern friend from foe. It didn't last long though. Not only were the guys outnumbered, but apparently drunk to boot, which was probably why this all started to begin with. Two of them ended up pushing past us after a pretty good beating and bolted across the parking lot. One even tripped and fell straight on his face on the concrete, but scrambled back up and kept going. That got Jake to start laughing his ass off. I was trying to tend to some swollen, probably broken knuckles and Mark is cussing up a storm because he ripped the sleeve off his rented tux somewhere in that madness. One of the guys got knocked out cold, and I mean he's out, snoring deeply. If you've ever seen someone get knocked out, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's not normal snoring, but like loud, deep snoring. He's just laid out cold on his back in a fucking suit laying amongst trash and dirt. I asked if we should drag him out into the parking lot so someone can find him or something, but Dave just says, nah, fuck him. So we start to pile out of the alleyway with Mark saying, hold on, give him a minute, he'll catch up. We hear a zipper and turn around to see him with his back to us, and he's literally pissing on this guy, at which point Jake is almost doubled over laughing so hard he's wheezing. Mark gets done, zips up, and comes back outside still cussing about his sleeve. He thanks us and tells us to meet him back at his place afterwards. He was the only one of us at the time that lived on his own in a studio apartment, so we split off with Jake, barely able to control himself the whole time, randomly bursting back into fits of laughter. It catches on and I follow him in the laughter. It honestly was pretty funny. Mark pissing on the guy snoring so loud he could have set off a car alarm. The only one not laughing is Dave, who took a pretty good blast to the head and is complaining of a headache. We take off in his car though and intend just to go back to his place and hang out until after prom. Along the way he stops at McDonald's and buys a few burgers, asking if we want any. The night drags by from there. We do end up going to Mark's place after the prom but don't stay too long as he kind of politely shoes us out so he can spend some alone time with his date. We were going to call it a night, but Dave says we haven't even touched the booze in his trunk, but there's no way we can even take it out, let alone drink it near his place because his dad will beat him. Jake's mom doesn't even know he's gone, 
and hates Dave anyway from a previous incident involving booze. My house isn't going to work either, so Dave decides we'll just drive to this abandoned movie theater a few blocks over and stand around outside. We agree and that's exactly what we do. The idea that the police could find us here drinking becomes clear and Dave decides to park on the block behind the movie theater with us walking through a small little clearing of woods leading up behind the building. We'd been standing near the side of the front of the building cracking jokes and still laughing about Mark pissing on the guy in the alley. I wasn't drinking much, I don't really like beer, so I just had a few pulls from the vodka bottle. Jake was already getting wobbly legged though and Dave had already stopped feeling a bit lightheaded. Suddenly bright lights pour into the parking lot and a car comes rolling slowly in. It's about 20 feet away and turned with a passenger door to us. Dave says he thinks it's the police and to be ready to bolt back through the woods, something that's probably not going to be real easy for Jake. It's not the police though, it's a sedan of some sort and a guy leans out of the window and yells, What the fuck are you little faggots doing here on my lot? Jake, ever the badass of course, yells back telling them to fuck off. The guy starts to slide back into the car and then opens the door to let himself out and the driver turns off the engine. The guy getting out yells back, The fuck did you just say to me? Jake kind of wobbles for a second then pushes past me and yells at the top of his lungs, I said go fuck yourself! and launches a half full bottle of vodka at the car. It falls short and smashes several feet in front of the guy. Then all the doors open and the driver and three more guys from the back seat come pouring out. One of them has a baseball bat. Without even hesitating, I just grab Jake's collar and slap Dave on the shoulder and say, It's time to go now. And we take off towards the woods. We hear them start running behind us as we come crashing through the bushes leading into the woods. Jake is stumbling all over the place to the point where I'm having to hold onto his shirt sleeve to ensure he doesn't take a dive. We get to the car which is luckily unlocked and dive inside as we kind of half ass toss Jake into the back seat who's laughing like an asshole as he tumbles in. Dave starting up the car as we all turn and realize they didn't follow us all the way. At least if they did, we can't see them. The woods aren't thick enough to really hide too well in them, but it is pretty dark. At this point, it's probably after midnight. There are only two ways out of the block we're parked in. One goes all the way around the entire neighborhood, and the other is behind us and goes back around the front of the movie theater. We decide to just go back that way as fast as we can. We probably should have went the long way around, but none of us were completely thinking straight or even really sober at that point. As we come around the bend leading in front of the movie theater, the sedan is coming out of the lot, not even three feet from Dave's car as he passes by. I'm sitting in the passenger seat and make eye contact with a passenger from the sedan. He's got a shaved head and is shirtless, and he just flashes me this evil grin as he points at us and says something to the driver. They pull out right behind us and are right on Dave's ass. The passenger is leaning out of his window and yelling something that I can't hear over the misfit CD in the car. And then he throws something that clunks off the roof of the car and goes skittering over the hood. A tall boy beer can. We're coming up on the three lane highway that's dead empty and these guys start to speed up and try to pull up alongside my side of the car and swerve into us. Dave panics and hits the brakes which causes them to slightly clip his front bumper and bolt ahead of us. He then starts forward again and tries to slip behind them into the other lane. They cut him off and start to pull up against us again, this time on the driver's side. The passenger is hanging out the window again, this time almost sitting on the door and rears back and swings something towards the car. It's the baseball bat. He misses and the car swerves for a moment. Dave is wide-eyed and muttering, Oh shit, oh fuck, shit. Even Jake has quit laughing at this point. The car swerves back and Dave is trying to move to the far end of the lane. The passenger swings again and connects sort of with the driver door. It clips the rearview mirror and knocks it back. Dave rolls down his window and in desperation throws the only thing he has at hand back at this guy. 
First the CD case which misses the passenger and shatters against the top rim of the door, and then a handful of as much loose change as he can grab from his console. Quarters, nickels, dimes, and pennies go flying. Some of it hits the passenger in the face and arm, and some sails into the car, some missing entirely. That seems to have some sort of effect as the passenger pulls back into the car and Dave floors it. Another minute or two go like this and as we're coming to an intersection with another car at the light, Dave begins to slow down and turns on his signal to turn into a parking lot of a quick trip gas station. As soon as the car stops, just get out calmly and quickly and we go inside. This is a police substation. It's safe. Just take a leak, buy a soda or something. Don't act like anything's up. Dave says as he pulls in front of the store. We get out and dart inside. Jake goes into the bathroom and is in there for a while. Dave and I buy a soda and some bottled water. The clerk asks us if we went to prom, how it was, etc. We keep small talk with him, hoping Jake didn't pass out on the toilet. He finally comes stumbling out of the bathroom, grinning. The clerk observes. Looks like he had fun. Dave nervously forces out a chuckle and says, He's not feeling so well. It's kind of hot outside. Which it was. Our friends have pulled into the back of the parking lot behind the gas pumps and are sitting there idling. Dave notices and nods to them for me to notice. I decide to try and stall some time and ask for directions to a Taco Bell that I knew full well is on the other side of town, saying we were trying to meet some friends there. The clerk is thinking on that for a moment and starts to give pretty detailed directions there as we notice the sedan apparently give up after having sat there for a few moments. We wait for the guy to finish, thank him and then pick up a pack of winter mint gum that we forgot, just to make sure and pass another minute of time or so. After getting back into the car, Dave says he's going to drop me off and then sneak Jake in through his back door to sleep it off until the morning. And that's that. We luckily didn't run into the crazy guys in the sedan again, and that ended a night that even 13 years later, I'll never forget. My significant other Kyle and I went to an absolutely fantastic concert for New Year's Eve. We met up with a few friends, but they all left right after midnight. The bands were great, so we wanted to stay for the rest of the show. Kyle got a call from a good friend Nathan around 1am. Nathan said he was at the same bar and wanted to know if we were still there. We were stoked, because Nathan never gets out of the house. He's a super cool guy and we love hanging out with him. He had his girlfriend with him, who I like a lot, and his friend Derek. I don't like Derek at all. Derek just gives off a creepy vibe. He talks slow and monotone, and he stares for too long and leans in too close. He is Nathan's pity friend. They were best friends for a long time and Derek's family did a lot for Nathan during a rough time. Nathan will bring him along every now and then because he feels obligated at this point, but he has no trust in him whatsoever. Derek is also a drug addict. Anyways. We all hang out and have some laughs. Derek sits there being freaky as usual, just staring at everyone. When he would speak, it would be something off the wall and completely unrelated to anything we were talking about. Once, he looked at Don and I and said, I think it'd be really weird if you two made out. Okay, yeah, it would be weird. We ignored him and kept having fun. The bar closed down and Kyle asked him if they wanted to come to our house and have some more drinks and play foosball and Tekken. I was a little annoyed because he didn't okay this with me first and I was ready for bed. I wasn't that upset though, I know that Kyle likes to have his company. I told Kyle that I wouldn't mind if it was just Nathan and Don, but I don't want Derek in our house. I don't trust him. Kyle brushes it off and says, what's the worst that can happen? It'll be fine. He's just weird. Well, when we were all leaving, we had to wait for Derek in the parking lot for the longest time. Turns out he was waiting outside the door of the bar and trying to get to any girl to come with him 
bribing them with free pills. I got mad and said, what makes you think it's okay to invite random people to my house? He just laughed. We get to my house and he sits on the couch beside me. He keeps poking and when I ask him what he wants, he just stares at me for about 10 seconds before saying, what's up? I started ignoring him. He continued to poke and even tried to tickle my feet. I wouldn't even look over. Then he starts getting phone calls from people asking for pills. I went to the bathroom and he tried to follow me in there. I just pushed him out and locked the door and he continued to knock. After this, he starts trying to get Nathan and Don to take him home, which was about 45 minutes away and it's now already 4 a.m. They tell him no way and they agree that he was staying with them. They actually only live about 10 minutes away and they both wanted to go home to sleep in their own bed. He didn't want to go to their house. He either wanted to go home or stay at my house. He started whining and telling me that I had to convince them to stay and I told him no. He started to say that Don had drank too much to drive. The girl had one beer the entire night. When they were going to leave, Derek comes back in and says he needs to use the bathroom. Kyle is overly trusting of people and doesn't pay attention to weird behavior. I am the opposite, so I was keeping an eye on Derek. I caught him going through my prescription bottles. They were nothing but antibiotics, but it pissed me off that he was trying to steal from us anyways. I told him he needed to leave immediately. He then stood in our kitchen, refusing to leave, just staring at us. I said that they were waiting on him and he needed to go with them immediately. He kept staring and said, Don't you remember that time I gave you guys a ride? Well, make it even. You either convince them to stay, or I stay here and y'all take me home. No way. He gave us a ride home when we had a flat once, and we lived two blocks apart at the time. We are not going 45 minutes away to take a weirdo home that's refusing to leave for reasons unknown. He kept saying that Don was drunk. Kyle speaks up and says, If you get in a roadblock, I'll come get you. He says, Well, are you going to post the bail too? Because we're your responsibility now. I am beyond frustrated at this point and told Kyle, You invited them, now get rid of him. I went and sat on the couch. Derek continued to stand there and stare at Kyle. Kyle, normally passive, is getting angry and telling him it's time for him to go and that we aren't taking him home or convincing anyone to stay. Derek says that he's not leaving, so he has to do one or the other. Kyle finally went outside and got Nathan to come and literally drag Derek to his car. Nathan had apologized profusely and says that he isn't bringing Derek around anymore, which I'm thankful for and thankful that we didn't allow him to spend the night because who knows what he would have done once we fell asleep. I was invited to a party on New Year's Eve, and a couple that are my friends were invited too. Since the guy knew the way to the party and I didn't, and they live about 20 minutes from me driving, I gave them a ride. It was a nice party with 15 friends, and we spent the night okay. But in the morning, even though that our friend had told us we could sleep at his house and drive home when we woke up, we still decided it was time to go home. This was around 5.30 a.m. I drank only a bit of champagne so I could drive, and both my friends from the couple drank almost nothing since they were spending the next day with the girl's family and didn't want to be hung over, so we were sober when this happened. We said our goodbyes and got out of the house. We know that the area is known for having pretty sketchy characters, but the car was a two minute walk from the house and we didn't expect to get in trouble. We were wrong. So as we got out of the house there was this one guy just standing in the middle of the parking lot smoking what smelled like weed. We walk on the opposite side of the road of this guy, but he starts messing with my girlfriend. She's really pretty so guys usually stare and she's used to it but this guy starts making infelicitous comments to her with her obvious boyfriend, my friend, that has his arm around her right there. We look at him 
but say nothing since we are right next to the car when he starts walking towards us. So we get in and I quickly lock the doors and drive away fast before he can catch up to us. But since that town was unknown to us and big, we had to stop and turn the GPS on. After we do this we get on the road but immediately have to stop at a red light. A car stops right next to us, which would be normal if it wasn't like 5.45 a.m. We look at it and that creepy guy is inside staring at us. At this time we started commenting that he probably saw our car stopped and was waiting for us to ride away. But we didn't want to freak out so we just kept looking forward and kept driving thinking we were probably overreacting and that this guy could just be going the same way as us. But as the drive continues we get on the highway, so does the guy and he is obviously stalking us. When I speed up, he speeds up. When I slow down, he slows down. I even pretended I was going to leave the highway in one exit and quickly return to the main highway road and he copied that exact same move. We start freaking out but keep driving as me and the girl's boyfriend try to calm her down saying there are two of us and only one of him who is very lightly high. We are not that huge, I'm like 5'9", 140 pounds and her boyfriend is like 5'10", 154 pounds and the guy besides being tall was really skinny too and we were just afraid of how crazy he was, crazy enough to stalk us. 40 minutes of stalking later we get out of the highway so I can take them home but I stop two streets away from my girlfriend's house and the car stops behind us making her boyfriend jump out of the car and me following him. I wouldn't let him be alone, we don't know how crazy that guy is and I have a really heavy bat in my car which I take with me. It's forbidden to have this kind of thing in cars in my country but whatever, I have it anyway for protection. As we start approaching the car he quickly speeds up making a U-turn and driving away back for the highway or so we thought. My friends take their stuff and say they can make the walk home, it's about 3 minutes, going between the buildings and avoiding the roads so we say our goodbyes and I get back to the car and start driving to the highway to get home. As I make the U-turn to get close to the highway I see that creepy guy's car waiting there and he starts following me again probably thinking my girlfriend is still there. Now I freak out a little bit more, I'm alone and even if I have the bat in the car I don't know what this guy has in his so we get on the highway and I start driving normally pretending I didn't see him and the second I see two huge trucks in front of me I speed up and pass between them. At this time I'm driving around 87 miles per hour looking at my rear view mirror to see if I'm losing the guy. My exit appears and I take it. I get off the main road into a side road from where I can see the highway and stop there. I turn off the car lights and look at the highway and see that guy's car get off of the highway but quickly getting back on. I guess I really lost him and he just got out and re-entered because the place where I live is the last exit where the highway is free of charge. I calm down and drive home all the way looking behind my shoulder. Nothing really happened but my greatest fear was for my friend and for me after I was alone. A few years ago I was 19, I'm a female and I was coming home from watching the fireworks display on New Year's Eve. It was 3 a.m. when I reached my safe, family-friendly, nothing-ever-happens neighborhood. I'm from Sydney, Australia and live in a posher and wealthier neighborhood. My friends wanted to call a taxi because we didn't want to wake our poor parents at this hour to drive us back home. Because of my stubbornness and insistence, we ended up taking the very long walk home. My friend Aiden was complaining most of the time, guess you can't blame him. Rowan was just silent and compliant. I was cheerful. When we reached almost my street we split ways. The guys continued on their very long way home, much longer than mine and I continued on mine. When I passed a little cake shop I noticed a guy across the street. I only looked at him briefly 
but something in the way he quickly looked up at me almost in interest caught my attention. I hurried on anyway, because I'm usually paranoid about things and 99% of the time it's just me being paranoid. I turned onto my street, which was much darker than I had anticipated. This was about 3.15am, mind you. As I passed the bowling club in the oval, I kept looking behind me just to make sure. It was getting quite cold and dark, so I started feeling creeped out. But there was no one behind me, no one anywhere as far as I could see. I was halfway down my street where the road dips down when I noticed something on the path in front of me. I couldn't tell what it was, and at the last moment I stepped off the path onto the road to avoid it because it looked like it might be a dead animal. And as I stepped onto the road, I turned slightly and saw that there was someone behind me. They weren't too close, but they weren't too far away either, and I remember my heart leapt into my throat because I hadn't seen them before, and for them to have gotten that close in that short space of time, something about it didn't sit well with me. I couldn't see who it was nor could I tell if it was male or female because it was just a black figure to me. It was a very brief glimpse. I was scared though so I whipped out my phone and started to call Aiden. I kept calling him but silly Vodafone wouldn't connect me to him so I tried to call Rowan but he wouldn't pick up. I kept this up at least five times getting increasingly anxious but not daring to look behind me to see if he was still there. I'm glad I didn't actually. I think I would have really freaked out if I'd confirmed it. By that time I reached my driveway and I hurried up it thinking I was safe. But as I was halfway up I looked over my shoulder again just really quickly and saw the figure there. The way I explain this next bit is really confused and muddled because on the one hand it may have looked like it was merely passing my driveway, but on the other hand, I am much more certain that it looked like he was just about to step onto the driveway as if to walk up. And at that precise moment that I thought that, it occurred to me that he might be my brother Jonathan, because no one else would bother walking up my driveway. Even if some guy was following me, it never occurred to me that he would really go to the lengths of going up the driveway as well. I thought I was completely safe because I had the advantage of my house close by when he started following me. However, something about the build of this figure didn't seem like Jonathan to me, so I hurried on in anyways. My beautiful, wonderful, amazing mother had stayed up to wait for me, and I am so glad because she opened the door for me as soon as I knocked. I hate to imagine what would have happened if I had to wait for a while. I went inside but I left the second door open and the outside light on because I thought, Jonathan might be coming in any second now, but mom was like, you can turn them off, your brother came back two hours ago. I did get a little creeped out then, but I just dismissed the thought because we are so quick to think we are always so safe. Closed the door, shut the light and went to get a drink of water. Mom went to bed. I went to my room to grab my clothes and then went to the bathroom to take a shower. I switched off the living room lights. This is sort of funny now that I think about it. Before I took a shower I replied back to a message from Aiden who was asking if I was home safe yet. I demanded to know why he hadn't picked up his phone and then told him that I was creeped out for a few minutes but I was okay now. Then as I showered I actually thought about that figure. I wasn't convinced that it was following me, but my mind did teeter into wondering this or that. In any case, I remember thinking it was okay because I was safe now. Then near the end of my shower, I heard something at my window. It didn't sound like the usual creaking or bumping of an old house. The way I described it to other people was like the sound of someone resting their hands against the window to steady themselves. It sounded really unnatural, I know because it got my attention straight away and I immediately jumped to the possibility that there might be someone outside. And I know that only a really strange sound would make me do what I did next, which was to turn off the water and crouch under the window, hiding and waiting. I waited for quite some time, too scared to move for a few minutes, but there was nothing. So I gingerly crawled out, still too scared to stand up properly 
and I switched off the bathroom lights. But then it was impossible for me to dry myself and dress myself, so I turned on the heater light which is much smaller and dimmer. But as I did that, I noticed at the window that there were very small blue lights there that certainly never belonged there. The way I can describe it now, it was almost like a keypad of a phone lit up. I was so scared, but I switched off the heater light as well and backed into the corner, my towel wrapped around me, and I waited. It seemed like a long time that I waited, too scared to unlock the door and move because I knew it would make a lot of noise. And as I waited in pitch darkness, several blue lights came on outside the window, like a few. It became very bright and they were moving it, trying to shine it through the window. Now that I think about it, was it a phone? I'm not sure, there were a few lights. But that did it, I practically bolted for my mum. I unlocked the door and went into my parents' room, trembling like a leaf and gibbering that there was someone outside the bathroom window. I was clearly very upset, so mum ushered me around trying to find a safe room for me to change into, and dad apparently heard the footsteps hurrying back down the driveway, and I am glad he did because the situation feels so surreal to me now that I'm not even sure if it really happened. Maybe I imagined it all, but this is confirmation that it wasn't just my imagination. I was so shaky, I slid into bed and couldn't sleep the whole night until it was morning. And even when it was morning, I was still terrified, especially when I heard Dad leave the house and go into the backyard. So that's my lesson learned never walking home at night again. I'm even a bit worried during the daytime. We never did find out who it was. People wonder if it was the same person I'd passed earlier, but I don't know. My brother doesn't think so either. He says it may have been someone lurking at the oval who came out of a little hole as I was walking past the supposed dead animal on the path because of how suddenly they appeared behind me. Please don't walk home at night alone, girls. It only takes one moment for you to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it can go very wrong. This is by far the most creepy thing that has happened to me to date. I usually feel fairly safe in my town. But this one incident had certainly awakened me to the fact that no place is perfectly safe. It was New Year's Eve when my friend called me and asked if I wanted to go to the New Year's Eve festival at the beach with her friend and her boyfriend. Being the kind of person who normally just stays at home and does nothing special for this particular holiday, I of course agreed. Every New Year's Eve my town holds a festival at the beach in celebration. Rides and games are set up. Bands play live music, clubs hold late night fancy dress parties and at midnight on the dot a series of firework displays are put on for the public. Normally thousands of people show up so the beach can get quite loud and crowded but it's still a pleasant atmosphere all around. Before hanging up, my friend Jess asks me if I will pick her up and her boyfriend Tyler on the way to the beach. She also lets me know that one of her other close friends is coming along and that we should go straight to her unit so that we can all walk down to the festival together. I tell Jess no problem and then get ready to go. In about half an hour I'm ready. I don't yet have my license so I asked my dad if he would pick up my friends and drop us all off. He agreed. It only takes about 3 minutes to drive to my friend's place and then a further 10 minutes to drive to my other friend's unit. My other friend Haley lives in a small 2 bedroom unit with her mother. The unit is right next to the beach and only takes around 5 minutes to walk down to where the festival takes place. When we arrive she was already outside waiting for us, standing on the balcony and enjoying the sunset. We all file out of the car, making sure to thank my dad for dropping us off and then head upstairs to greet Haley. We all hug and begin to catch up as we hadn't seen each other for a couple of months. Graduation, work and life got in the way. We all headed inside for about 10 minutes to grab a drink and catch up a bit more. Haley's mother came out and talked to us for a bit as well. At this point the sun had almost well and truly disappeared 
and so we decided this was the perfect time to head down to the festival. The walk down to the beach was pleasant. It was a warm summer night. There was a cool breeze to ward off the heat and the whole area smelled of cotton candy, buttered corn and warm donuts. We spent the first few hours going on rides together and then we went out and bought some food and sat on the sand to eat. So far the night was amazing, as usually whenever I went out with friends there was always a parent with us. No parents this time, it felt great, it felt like freedom. After eating we went up to the stage where the live bands were playing and danced for about an hour. There were plenty of classics being played such as YMCA, Time Warp and various hits from Greece. All in all it was a really fun time. After an hour of dancing to the music, the four of us decided to head back to Haley's unit for a drink of water, as we had spent all of our money. At this point it was well and truly dark, around 11 o'clock, and the heat of the day had subsided to a pleasant warmth. We walked along the path merrily, saying Happy New Year to every passing group or cop. A few partygoers on the fourth floor of an apartment complex shouted, Hope you have an epic New Year, drunkenly at us. We laughed and wished them the same. As we walked further away from the crowds and the noise, the light grew less and less. There aren't many street lights near my friend's unit and we were soon engulfed in a soothing darkness with only the moon to light our way. It was at this point that I, for some reason, began to feel uneasy. It was too quiet for my taste. You know that feeling you get when you're being watched, or at least think you're being watched? That exact feeling washed over me, and I subconsciously moved to walk in between Haley and Tyler instead of walking on the outside of the group. I shrugged off that feeling after that, attributing it to the fact that perhaps my ears were just used to the loud noises of the festival. They were, after all, ringing a bit. We ran into another group of people we knew from school along the way, and the feeling was completely forgotten. I had missed these people after graduation and immediately struck up friendly, light-hearted conversation. We parted ways as we made it to Haley's unit block and climbed the stairs to her unit. Haley's mother and the mother's boyfriend greeted us upon arrival and we all got a drink of water from the refrigerator before relaxing together on the couch. We were all a tad worn out at this point and the fireworks weren't for another hour, so we decided to chill at the unit and head down to the beach at around a quarter to twelve. We all joked around and had a snack, and then Haley asked if she can sleep over at my place. I ring my folks, check if it's okay with them, and they give me the okay. My parents love having Haley over, she's a very well-mannered person and likes to help out where she can. At a quarter to twelve, we all leave the unit and begin heading down toward the beach. We only get a minute down the road before Haley says that she has forgotten her pain medication for her bad knee which she is supposed to take before bed. At this, Jess seems to be a little annoyed, but reluctantly agrees that we should go back so that we don't have to make another trip back to her place at the end of the night. We head back and the whole way Jess seems a little distant, like her mind isn't on the conversation at hand and she's focused on something else. I'm the most quiet and observant one of the group, so I notice her silence pretty quickly since usually she's a big chatterbox. I ask if she's alright and she replies with, of course, and so I simply leave her to her thoughts. After retrieving Haley's pain medication we head back out again. This time Jess suggests we walk on the other side of the road where it is more well lit and there are parents with their children on the playground. We think nothing of it and agree, as both Haley and I have poor night sight and a bit more light would be rather welcome. When we are halfway across the road Jess mutters to us, don't look behind us. My first thought is that maybe there is a drunk with their pants down taking a piss against the wall or something, but then just adds, walk faster. I begin to feel uneasy and immediately obey her request knowing that whenever Jess seriously tells us to do something, it's usually for a good reason. None of us look back despite that nagging human instinct to look. I trust Jess. When we are across the road, I ask Jess what is wrong and what has her so on edge. She replies to me, there's three guys in black hoodies following us. I recognize them from earlier. Earlier? I think to myself puzzled, 
and then Jess explains that she saw those same three men. They had to be men, they were tall and bulky, when we came to the unit for water earlier. A chill runs down my spine at this, and I realize that my sense of being watched probably came from those men. What made me even more creeped out was the fact that they had waited all that time for us to come out. Unable to resist, I glance sideways out of my peripheral vision, and my heart hammers in my chest when I notice the three men. They are indeed rather pointedly following us, and they have their hoods zipped up all the way to their chins. This would not be so unusual if not for the fact that it was a hot night. There was no need for a hoodie or any kind of jacket, and they were wearing bandanas over their mouths and noses. I couldn't make out either of their facial features, and this scared me. Jess prompts us not to look and suggests we walk even faster. We do so, despite the fact that Haley, Tyler, and I are all tall and strongly built people, I should mention now that I am an 18-year-old female, and despite my build and reasonable strength, I understandably didn't want to tangle with three big unknown men dressed in all black with bandanas covering their features. It crossed my mind that they probably thought we were good targets. Jess was short and thin. They most likely heard that Haley needs pain medication. I walked with an obvious limp as I have arthritis in my right knee and Tyler had his hands full, being the pack mule as they call it. Despite Jess's instruction, I can't help but give the occasional glance at the three men, and of course they continued to follow us. They had even increased their pace to nearly match ours, and kept looking over at us. I think they meant to intimidate us, as they made it quite obvious that they were staring at us. I ceased to look after realizing they could probably tell I was keeping an eye on them, and instead opted to use my keen hearing to make sure they stayed across the road. I wasn't fond of this, as they could have had a knife or gun or anything if they had suddenly sprinted at us and I wouldn't be prepared, but I didn't want to provoke them by staring. I am not a fast runner, and my stamina leaves much to be desired. At this point the path ends and gives way to bushes and shrubs. The bushland is quite easy to go around, but doing so would mean moving closer to the unknown men following us. None of us wanted to do that, so we all make an unspoken agreement to take a shortcut through the bushes. The bushland doesn't go on for very long and would take us straight to the festival where we could quite possibly lose these men. We head into the bushes, taking care to stay together and watch for snakes as summer's the season when snakes like to come out most. Especially at the Beast, it's Snake City. About halfway through we all recognize the sound of dried grass and leaves crunching underfoot. Then we hear rapid and heavy footsteps. We all broke into a sprint, not daring to look back at this point. We didn't have to look to know these men were chasing us, and their confidence at going after four fully grown teenagers pretty much assured me that they were armed with weapons of some sort. We were not armed with anything and quite frankly we were all so spooked that we couldn't think straight. Our only instinct was to run as fast as possible. We made it out of the bushland together, raced across the car park and slowed to a jog when we reached the crowds. We didn't stop, but as we steadily slowed to a hurried walk, I looked over my shoulder and recognized the three unknown men lurking across the car park. Moonlight glinted off the surface of a metallic object in the taller one's hand, and I immediately fell ill. We hurried down to where the biggest crowd was, gathered on the sand in preparation for the fireworks. Picking a spot between two large groups, we settled down and caught our breaths. Funnily enough, all four of us have asthma, which we often joke about, saying that we found each other and bonded because of it, and we were all panting quite heavily. Tyler and I have it a bit worse than Haley and Jess, and you could hear us wheezing as we panted. Soon the fireworks started, and we had all calmed enough to somewhat enjoy them although the unknown men were still in the back of our minds. Our original plan had been to leave before the fireworks were finished so that we could avoid the big crowds, but instead we opted to leave with the crowds. We walked down the road to the bigger car park where my dad was going to pick us up, making sure to stay around people. When we reached the car park, I called my dad, and he said that he would be there to pick us up in around 10 minutes. 
After hanging up, I sat on the side of the path with my friends and waited. Five minutes passed and, bored, I decided to look around as there were still many bustling crowds making their way to their cars. There was a bit of a traffic jam too as many cars were trying to leave at the same time. I looked across the road and realized with a jolt that three men in the black hoodies were there, half hidden behind a tree where there was no light. Even though I couldn't see their eyes, I could tell they were staring right back. They knew I'd spotted them. The taller one discreetly showed his knife, waving it a little as if to taunt me. Then he raised it to his throat and made a slow mock slicing motion. I quickly told my friends and we moved to a different spot, making sure to stay in the light and stay in sight of people. My dad arrived soon after and we all quickly climbed into the car. None of us spoke a word of what happened and since then I haven't had any issues with anyone following me or my friends. It still gives me the creeps though. Whoever those men were, their intentions could not have been good. I went to a college in Los Angeles and joined a sorority in my first year. During my second year, I moved into the sorority because it was cheap and fun. The sorority had two stories and a basement. Other than storage, we only used the basement for initiation and other ceremonies. The first floor had a kitchen, dining room, study room, living room, guest bedroom, and the house mother's room. The guest room and the house mother's room were in the front of the house facing the street. The second floor was full of bedrooms with two to six girls in each room. It also had all of the showers except for one in the guest room that was never used. About 50 girls lived in the house together and it was a ton of fun, with parties almost every night. Of course, with that many girls sharing one space, people got on each other's nerves every now and then. One big point of contention was food. Although we were provided with three square meals Monday through Friday, many girls kept their own provisions in a small kitchen behind the main kitchen. One girl named Megan loved to bake and would always be happy to share her creations once they were perfectly frosted or whatever. Right after winter break, Megan baked a tray of brownies and left them to cool overnight while she went to bed. When I woke up the next morning, a group of girls were sitting around the table drinking coffee and bitching about Kristen, who apparently came home drunk the night before and dug into Megan's brownies with her bare hands. There was a big messy chunk missing from the middle of the pan with fingernail marks along the bottom. I agreed that it was pretty fucked up. Kristen, of course, denied that she had anything to do with it. However, things started being eaten in the middle of the night with some regularity. The suspects were always the ladies who came home late after partying. One night there was a formal event that required all of the girls to be out of the sorority. The only person left at home was Miss Betty, our house mother. She was a sweet woman in her 70s who pretty much let us get away with anything and everything. On this particular evening, Miss Betty heard the shower running in the guest room. She knocked on the guest room, but nobody answered. She cracked the door open and saw a pile of clothes with the sorority's letters, sorority t-shirt, sorority sweatshirt, sweatpants, and hat. Miss Betty entered the guest room and said something along the lines of, Are you okay, dear? Because it was so odd for someone to be using the guest room shower. The shower room turned off and there was a grunting thud against the inside of the bathroom door. Very alarmed, Miss Betty tried to force her way into the bathroom asking if the person inside needed help. To her dismay, a low male voice grunted back, Go away! Miss Betty told him to get dressed and that she was calling the police. The unwanted house guest stayed in the bathroom until the police arrived. They determined that he snuck into the sorority during winter break picking out clothes from different rooms. He made himself a little home in the basement and had apparently lived there for almost a month. We had at least one ceremony in the basement during the period of time he would have been living there. So, I guess he was watching. As of now, I'm a junior in college. 
This story took place the spring semester of my freshman year. My friend Jane and I decided to do spring rush at our college. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Greek system, my college had traditional fall rushing for sororities. You go through the application process, do certain things for different sororities, etc. Then they had spring rush for the girls that didn't get in during the fall or if they changed their mind throughout the year. Jane was my roommate and she kind of dragged me into it. It was a, uh, if I have to suffer, then so do you type of thing. I went along with it, having never even thought about being in a sorority before. The process went smoothly, and we got to the second to last phase before big day, the day you find out if you got into the sorority. One of the missions that the sorority sisters had us do was to house sit for them while they went out and got completely shit-faced on a Friday night. No big deal. I had Jane to keep me company anyway. We were given a strict list of who was and wasn't allowed into the house. All Jane and I had to do was order our weight in pizza, watch One Tree Hill, and just a little bit of homework to do while we waited. It wasn't until about 1am did the shit start. Someone rang the doorbell. I answered. It was a guy, older, maybe 25 or so. He looked past college age. He asked me if it was a certain address, and I told him no, then asked if he needed to speak to someone. He said no, he thanked me, then walked away. I really didn't think anything of it. It's college, Friday slash Saturday morning rather, and it was nighttime and people get drunk, so shit happens. One of the sorority girls calls and says they'll be back to the house in about an hour, so around 2 to 2.30 a.m. That's great. Then the doorbell rings again. Jane and I both answer it at the same time. It's the same guy. He looks at Jane, seemingly shocked to see her. Let me just describe his face to you, now that I'm thinking about it. He was wrinkled. He had deep laugh lines for such a young guy. Hazel eyes. They were speckled with dark colors. Black hair, a bit of stubble. Plainly attractive, but no catch. Very tall and lean an average Joe. Again, he asked me if it was a certain address. Jane straightens up and tells him to, and I quote, suck my dick, then close the door in his face. We laughed about the poor drunken frat guy that didn't remember where he lived. That's all we thought it was. Before we could get back into the living room area, the guy started pounding on the door and screaming for Kayla. He said her name over and over again. I didn't even have time to be scared because the window that was right next to the front door shattered. The fucker crawled inside, fell to the floor having lost his balance, and looks directly at me. My name isn't fucking Kayla, but he was looking at me like it was. Jane flipped her shit and ran upstairs. How classic, right? And I just stood there, baffled at what happened. I was paralyzed. The man kept asking for Kayla, got up, and looked at me like he was about to charge, like I was a piece of meat and he was a starving man. I just shook my head. I heard Jane on the phone somewhere upstairs. Then she called my name, came running downstairs. That's when he did something so, so unexpected. As Jane ran down the stairs, the man actually floored it to meet her. He started growling and screaming and howling? I can't explain it. He sounded deranged. Jane was so startled that she fell coming down the stairs, sprained her ankle, and just laid there, screaming. The guy laughed, walked past me, and then just casually climbed back out through the window. Campus police showed up about five minutes later, then the sisters did. Turns out that Kayla was a sister that was kicked out a few weeks prior. She had a boyfriend, who was abusive, addicted to meth, all of the above, that broke into their house before and they fucking failed to mention that small little detail. He was arrested later that night, sobered up and was released the next day. The next day was actually big day. Jane and I got bids but I declined. Jane accepted. We're still friends and it always makes for a good story to tell the incoming freshman girls who plan on rushing. 
This happened to a friend of a friend's mom. It was the 70s and she was in a sorority in college. She went out with some friends to a bar and started chatting with some guy sitting next to her. He was normal, cute, and friendly. She thought nothing odd of him. The girls had decided to hit the bar before going to a party, so it came time for them to go. The guy asked her if she was sure she wouldn't rather go to a party at his house, and she said no thanks and left with her friends. Later, after she's arrived home and is in her room getting ready for bed, she hears a noise outside her door. She opens her bedroom door on the second floor and sees a man, the same one from the bar, stealthily walking up her stairs. She lived in a duplex, and the dog from next door had started barking, which scares him and he runs. A year or so later she's watching the news and sees the man's face from the bar. It's Ted Bundy. Two years ago my life was completely different. I was in a sorority, I had lots of friends, and I was outgoing. That was until the night of our Halloween grab-a-date. For those who have never been in the Greek system, it's a party where you invite only one person as a date. I had recently met a gorgeous guy who was on my college football team. I invited him and he said yes, but that his friend from out of town had to go too. I convinced a naive freshman to take him. On the afternoon of the big day, there was a football game, so unlike the majority of girls and their dates, I had to wait for my date instead of getting drunk. The game ended with just enough time to take a shot of vodka with my date and the two guys before we had to rush to the bus to meet the freshman and go to the boat where the party would be held. I ended up finding my date and his friend rather creepy while on the boat and ignored him for most of the night and just danced with my friends instead. Unfortunately my keys were at his apartment so after we got off the boat and back to the Greek system I had to return to his place. This was when things went wrong. I quickly went to his place and grabbed my keys, but by the time I found them he poured a shot for each of us. It was just me, his friend, and himself. I at first declined but they insisted I take it before I leave. I don't remember anything after that shot. The grab -a date was on October 30th, Halloween morning I woke up to a strange beeping. I was extremely confused and had no idea where I was, but I was terrified. I felt too weak to move, and after a few minutes realized that the beeping was coming from the machine that I was attached to. Even then I didn't realize where I was, I just started yelling. After what seemed like an eternity, a grumpy nurse walked in. I asked her for a phone which she gave me and left. In my confusion, I couldn't figure out the phone, so I had to yell for her to come back. Eventually, I figured it out and called my dad. This was the scariest Halloween for my father. Waking up early from an unknown caller that ended up being your daughter two hours away in the ER. After that phone call, I fell asleep and woke up to my dad in the room, crying. It turned out that I had stopped breathing a few times that night. The first time was within a half hour of taking that shot. I later found out that rather than calling for help, he left my body on the footsteps of my sorority where thankfully another girl was coming home while he was walking away. She was the one who called the ambulance. Unfortunately I did not get tested. In my confusion I refused to be drug tested that morning and kept insisting that I wanted to go home. Too weak to walk, I had to be wheelchaired out then carried to my dad's car. My dad's partner works in the ER and said that it sounded like I had an allergic reaction to roofies. One of my mom's friends from a hospital suggested that as well, but by the time I wanted to be checked out, the hospital said it would have been out of my system by then. Later that day I looked through my cell phone and found I had texted a few of my friends for help, that I was creeped out and that I was scared. I had also received a text from him saying he wanted me to go to the bathroom and give him head. I decided to reply to his text and ask him what had happened and that I had woken up in the hospital. He replied, that sucks. As if this ordeal wasn't enough, after a few days when I returned to the school and sorority, 
a rumor had started that I had had alcohol poisoning. When I tried claiming that wasn't what happened, people told me I was just too embarrassed to admit it. I was even sent to standards, sorority court for when you get punished, and told I wasn't allowed to go on another gravidate that quarter. Very few girls asked if I was okay. I wasn't. I love camping. Anytime my friends and I came home from college, we would load up our cooler with beer, grab some gear, and go screw around outside. Unfortunately, when I was actually at school, none of my sorority sisters or other friends ever wanted to go with me, so I would often suffer withdrawals from camping. One day, the weather was way too nice to waste, so I grabbed some of my gear, hopped in a car I borrowed from a buddy, and drove to a spot that was secluded yet within a safe distance to civilization that I could run and get help if need be. Camping also creeps me out sometimes, but that creepy feeling is also somewhat of a plus for me. It's the same reason that people read these kind of scary stories. It's fun to be scared. So I make a little camp and get a fire going. I hadn't brought all that much to eat, but I was enjoying myself, reading and looking around the area, that sort of thing. I suddenly got the feeling that I was being watched, and I stopped dead in my tracks. I hear a twig crunch over to my right, then see a doe bolt from a hundred feet or so in front of me. I laughed at myself and went back to the camp with an armful of wood I had gathered. I kept freaking myself out, hearing sounds just outside of the ring of light cast by the fire. I always get inside my head so I shrugged it off and kept whittling at a stick I had been messing with. Around one I decided to go into my tent and snuff out the lantern. I had been slamming beers in the most unladylike fashion and smoking cheap cigars. Another reason I like camping, I can act however I want, so I passed out relatively quick. About two in the morning I start hearing footsteps and they sound pretty light and sort of timid. I think to myself it's a deer or another animal, more likely a raccoon because I probably left some food out. I'm still on guard though. About 30 minutes of sleeping with one eye open I hear a rubbing noise and the tent fabric is being pushed in a bit. I don't know how I didn't shit my sleeping bag, but I just sat there paralyzed with my caw bar in hand. I desperately wanted to thrust the knife through the tent fabric but I was still holding out hope that it was some of my buddies from a frat joking with me. And then as suddenly as it had begun, it all stopped. I was starting to feel slightly more secure, because daylight would be coming in about two or three hours, but I sure as shit wasn't going to go to sleep. All of a sudden, at about four o'clock, I realized I should put my boots on so that if anything did happen, I would be ready. After having stayed up and keeping alert a little while longer, my friend's car alarm goes blaring. I freak the fuck out and run out of the tent. I go about two steps before something grabs me around the mouth. I open my mouth to scream but instead the person's pinky finger slips between my teeth. I've heard that people can perform superhuman feats when they have huge adrenaline rushes. In my case, I just clamp down and... There's no way to say this without sounding ridiculous. His finger popped off. He screamed, pulled his hand away with the missing digit falling to the ground. He took off running down the hill I was camping on and I took off right quick in the opposite direction. I must have looked ridiculous to the people whose house I ran to. A little sorority girl in a wife beater, boxers, and steel toe boots. I also had some blood that had oozed out of my lip not from the finger, but because I had also managed to take a pretty good chunk out of my lip as well. I told them what had happened. They called the police, got me some real clothing and the man at the house made me a whiskey and coke. When the cops got there they checked it out. The cops went to check it out and when they came back it was light out. They brought me back so I could get my friend's car and what I saw just made me even more terrified. Right next to the tent was a red gas can. He could have just lit me on fire earlier. The finger was also gone, suggesting he had come back for it. The kicker is that they never caught the guy. So somewhere out there is a man sitting down to dinner, maybe alone, 
maybe with a wife and a couple of kids, and he's missing his right pinky. When my cousin and I were 12 and 13, we decided to walk to the playground. Not to play on it, of course. We were too old for that, but we did like to go there and have our own little privacy. We could talk about boys and school or whatever. It was in Sanston, Virginia, next to a tiny marine museum that was closed most of the time, so we would also climb on the minuscule ship and torpedo replicas. So we spent about a good hour or so chilling on the playground. We moved around a lot, floating from island to island. What caught our attention was that there was an older man walking towards us. He sat down on the bench closest to the slides that we were on top of, and then he opened a book. I still remember the book too. It was white with a huge boat on the cover. So he was sitting there and we didn't pay him any mind. It was pretty much time for us to leave. It was getting dark. So we slid down and that's when we noticed something strange about the old guy's shorts. The guy wasn't so close to us that we could see exactly, but there was something dark in the crotch. Maybe he shit himself, was my cousin's suggestion. I laughed incredibly loud and I remember he looked up and smiled and then resumed reading. We had to walk in his direction to walk back home. When we got closer to him, I elbowed my cousin extremely hard because I could finally make out what it really was. Holy shit, there's a slit in his pants. There's a fucking slit in his pants. The dark area we were seeing, this old man's penis. He had his legs open and his khaki pants were split open and his junk was hanging out. We pretended not to see it and continued walking faster but I will still never forget it. When we got home, we told my cousin's older sister, who then got on her bike and rode over there, but the man was gone. Shit was creepy. My guess it was a pedophile or someone who likes to show their junk to unsuspecting bystanders. I was 12 or 13 at the time, but I developed early. I was staying the night at my friend Rose's house and her mom left us to care for her little sister while she went out for a few hours. Being the good babysitters, we decided to head over to a local park with a playground to just hang out for a little while and let her sister play. We had been there about 30 minutes and were just hanging out pushing her little sis on the swings when two guys showed up and sat at a picnic table close to the playground. The first guy looked to be in his late teens, probably 5'10", short dark brown hair, brown eyes and medium build. But the other guy had to have been in his early 30s. He was a very large guy at probably 6'1", 250 pounds and had a full beard and shoulder length curly brown hair and green eyes. We noticed when they sat down but didn't really give them a second thought, as apart from their obvious age and physical appearance differences, there was nothing that really stood out about them. Till Chris, the older guy, decided to start a conversation with us. At first they just asked us our names, and gave us theirs and asked us what we were up to. Still being the polite kid I was raised to be, I answered him, but kept my answers short and continued playing with Rosa and her sister on the swings. He kept asking questions like where we were headed later and whether we wanted to hang out with him and his nephew, the younger guy whose name I don't remember, all the while getting closer and closer to us as he was talking. We told him that we were just going to go home after Rosa's sister was done playing and we weren't allowed to go anywhere else. He then offered me some beer that he had with him and asked me if I smoked. I had never drank any kind of alcohol at that point, and I wasn't about to start then, so I declined his offer. He then told me how pretty I was, and asked me if I had a boyfriend, and without skipping a beat, told me he had just recently gotten out of jail, and was looking for a girlfriend. 
I told him I didn't have a boyfriend and I wasn't interested in having one either. During this whole interaction, he would occasionally address his attention to his nephew and from the conversations they had, I quickly gauged that they were part of a gang. Which is when I actually started getting nervous as even I knew that you didn't mess with people in the local gangs and knew we had to be careful about what we said and did. He was quiet for a bit after that and I figured they were going to move on to go bug someone else. But I was wrong. He asked me again what we were going to do later and whether we wanted to go hang out with them, telling us how much fun we would have and how they were going to buy us beer and whatever we wanted. I told him again that we couldn't go anywhere and we had to watch Rose's little sister and he went quiet again. I know we should have just picked up and left right then, but I had just really started getting into my rebellious stage and thought we could handle these guys no problem and they weren't really a threat. We weren't ready to go back to Rose's house yet, so we went and sat at another picnic table, thinking that if we ignored them, they'd get the hint and go away. Of course, not one minute later, Chris and his nephew came and sat with us. His nephew stayed at one end of the table, but Chris decided to come sit right next to me and start telling me again how pretty I was and how he could be my boyfriend and we should just go hang out at his place or wherever I wanted to go. At this point his nephew started looking kind of nervous. He was very casually chatting with Rosa, but I could tell he realized how young we were and that his uncle was really starting to cross the line. He told him that he thought they should go do something else because Rosa and I couldn't go anywhere, but Chris wasn't having any of that. I don't remember what he said next as he was still sitting next to me, but next thing I know he put his arm around my shoulders and pulled me into his side. I was completely caught off guard and didn't even know how to react. I had never had an older guy that close to me, let alone touch me like that, and I had actually grown up quite sheltered. I know I should at least pushed him away or done something, but I froze. He kept saying again and again how he could be my boyfriend and he would take good care of me and asking me if I could go somewhere with him. I told him no and started trying to slowly get out from under his arm without making a big deal out of it. At that moment I started getting scared as he was getting pretty pushy and I really didn't want to piss him off as it was just us in the park and I couldn't see or hear anyone else around. He wasn't having that though. He pulled me close to him again, and this time he kissed me. It wasn't just a quick little peck. It was a forceful, lingering kiss that completely threw me off. My mind started racing. I couldn't believe what had just happened, and even Rosa was just sitting there with a look of complete shock on her face. I decided I had enough of this, and we had to get out of there. I pulled away one last time, and he told me again we should go somewhere to have some fun. He wasn't very creative, and just kept saying the same things over and over again, just wording them slightly different. It was now very obvious what he had on his mind. I told him that it was getting late, and we had to get to Rose's little sister's home, as her mom was going to be home soon. He didn't seem very happy with hearing that, so I told him that we had to take her sister home, but maybe we could come back and hang out with them some more. It was obvious he didn't want to let me go, so I kept telling him we had to go, but then I promised we would come back. Finally, I guess he either believed me or decided to let me get up, so I grabbed Rose's little sister to carry her home. I had just turned around and was getting ready to tell Rosa that we had to leave now, and suddenly he seemed to change his mind and stood up and came over to me. I had just put Rose's little sister down for a moment, as she was getting kind of heavy for me, and I knew we had a ways to walk, so I wanted to give my arms a break for a second. And he took that opportunity to grab me from behind and pull me into him, kind of like a bear hug with his whole body pressed up against mine. A whole flood of emotions ran through me at that moment. Fear, confusion, and still a bit of denial that he really would do something to hurt me, but I knew it was wrong either way, and I needed to get away from him. I was still in a kind of state of shock at that time, 
but I knew I had to keep my wits about me. I decided to play along that I liked him and try to work out a way for him to let us leave without making him mad or think I was lying to him. I told him again that we had to go and that Rose's mom would get mad and come looking for us, but I promised him that we would just drop her sister off and come back. He let me go, but still didn't seem convinced. I told him again, as convincingly as I could, that we had to take Rose's sister home and I promised him we would come back and told him to just wait for us there. He seemed to have bought it, so we quickly started walking back to Rose's house while he and his nephew were now sat at the table. As we started walking, I glanced back and saw his nephew trying to get him to leave again, so I thought, great, they're leaving. There's no way they are going to see where we are going or follow us. I was wrong. Just as I thought they were leaving in the opposite direction, Chris decided to follow us. We had a bit of a head start, but he was a really big guy and was gaining on us quickly. We hurried as fast as we could because we didn't want him to see where she lived, so once we got on her street, we took off running. We finally got back to Rose's apartment and thought we were in the clear. I could hear Chris calling me, but I couldn't see him so I thought they couldn't see us, so we went inside as quickly and quietly as we could. Once inside, we went over to the window and could still hear Chris calling my name and getting really close so we decided to stay quiet and carefully watch from the window to see if they had seen where we went or not. Luckily, they kept on walking right past Rose's apartment. We both breathed a huge sigh of relief and then started freaking out because neither of us had ever had anything like that happen before, but we were so glad it was over and we were in the clear. Shortly after that, Rose's mom got home and we went out to meet her in the parking area. Neither of us had any intentions of telling her what had happened as Rose's mom wasn't the nicest and we were sure we would get in trouble even though we hadn't done anything wrong. We all went back upstairs and were just chatting with Rose's mom and little brother, and then we heard a knock at the door. My heart stopped as I could swear I heard Chris's voice on the other side of the door. We both went back into the kitchen as Rose's mom went to answer the door. It was Chris and his nephew again. Somehow they must have seen us when we went out to meet her mom and seen which apartment we went into. They asked Rose's mom if we were there but luckily we were smart enough to give them fake names, and even then Rose's mom was having none of that and told them to get the hell out of there and slam the door in their face. Of course Rose's mom knew something was up and asked if we knew them, but we weren't about to admit we did, so we just told her we had no idea what was going on or who they were. I don't think she really bought it, but left it at that and just told us not to answer the door. Later that evening, her mom was going out again, but this time we didn't have to watch her little sister, so it was just Rosa and I in the apartment. We were just hanging out in the living room talking about how crazy that afternoon turned out to be and how glad we were that we didn't get into trouble, and then we hear it. Two voices that sound very familiar just outside the window. I was terrified to even move, and then came the knock at the door. There was no way we were answering it, so we just kept as quiet as possible and prayed they'd just go away. They called out our names and tried knocking again, and then one of them tried turning the doorknob. Thankfully, Rose's mom had locked it on her way out. They tried knocking one more time, and then all you could hear is their footsteps walking away from the door. We never saw either of them again and didn't go back to that park again for quite some time. It was an incredibly surreal experience. However, I will never forget his face, the feel of his body against mine, or what he tasted like, cigarettes and beer. I have no idea what triggered this memory from when I was 11, I was sitting in the living room talking or watching TV or something a few years back, maybe 2009, and it suddenly just popped into my memory. I live half of my life in Northern Virginia. 
My old elementary school, where my younger siblings still attended, had an open playground after all school functions were over on weekends and during the summer. There was also a nearby rec center, which was closer to the old playground than the new playground. The summer after my fifth grade year, 1999, is when this happened. My mother worked on the garden in front of the school, and with it being summer, probably early summer, she had a decent amount of work to do. We lived pretty close by, and we would go with her to play on the playground, and I would ride my bike around. My brother would have just finished third grade, so he could play with the other kids since I was usually nearby, and my younger sister would have just finished with kindergarten, thus staying with my older sister on the playground or with my mom while she worked in the garden. So I'm riding my bike around, staying on the sidewalk closer to the school because it was one of those older bikes that you had to pedal backwards to stop, so it wasn't very good on grass or even dirt. Anyway, I'm in front of a section of the school where there was a set of double doors, and the doors are set a ways into the wall, so that if you're right in front of them, there is a short wall on either side before you turn a corner and can walk down the rest of the building. Note that my mom is close to the entrance of the school, and while she can see the playground and the length of the side of the building, she can't see the area I'm speaking of, and I'm pretty sure there's more than one set of doors on this side. I have just gotten to this area, where I'm pretty sure there is a water fountain on one of the walls, because I can't think of another reason I would be there, and this man walks up. He starts talking to me. I turn to look at him, noticing the large dark sunglasses, and realize... He has his penis out. Being embarrassed that I'm seeing this man peeing, I turn away, but I can see his reflection in the windows on the doors. I don't really understand why he is shaking himself. I do now. Or why his voice is sounding funny, but I don't really think anything of it. I'm extremely uncomfortable, but still answering his questions. What are you doing out here today? Do you go to school here? I'm pretty sure he asked about members of my family, because he's an adult and I don't want to be rude. I finally gather the courage to hop on my bike and ride away, as he is not that close to me, but I don't say anything to my mom because I'm extremely embarrassed. I leave my bike near the car and go to the playground, trying to forget this unfortunate experience. And then I encounter a boy I met during this school year named Ronnie. He lived nearby, so I would see him every now and then. We're hanging out near where the other kids are. I had a crush on him and liked not to be so close to the younger ones because we were obviously much cooler, and he asked me if I'd seen the weird guy that was peeing. I told him I had, and we talked about how weird it was. As far as I know, he never mentioned this to his parents either. For some reason, we both thought he was peeing despite Ronnie being a year older than I was. Considering our comprehensive sex ed class and the fact that Ronnie was at the age when most boys are discovering themselves, we really should have known better. But as far as I know, no one on the playground got hurt. There weren't many kids around, and none of my siblings saw him. The fact that I didn't see any pee should have also been an indicator, but I was really embarrassed about it and wanted to just push it out of my memory. Fast forward to around 2009, and I suddenly and inexplicably recall this occurrence. I tell my mother about it, and being older and much less naive now, I know exactly what he was doing, still remembering exactly how he stood and everything. My mother was shocked, and expressed a wish that I would have told her, but doesn't remember anything in the news about a man being caught there or any children disappearing or reporting anything, so we assume that nothing beyond him masturbating in public happened. I don't recall ever seeing him again, though I'm sure seeing him peeing at a playground more than once would make me tell someone. This happened about nine years ago when I was in middle school, I had totally forgotten about it till my friend brought it up yesterday. In seventh grade, my best friend and I would walk down to her family's restaurant after school. 
It was about four blocks from the school, not a long walk at all. Between the school and restaurant, there was a public park with a playground. Only kids from the school would hang out there. Sometimes when the weather was nice, we would hang out at the park. If we were there for more than an hour, usually her uncle would come check on us. We did this for most of the school year. Around March, a strange man started showing up around the park, trying to talk to girls, asking about the school or things they liked to do. He did this for a couple of weeks, then disappeared. We never really thought much of it. Then one day it was just my friend and I at the park, and he shows up. He starts talking to my friend, trying to get him to go with her. She keeps telling him no. He grabs her arm and tries to pull her along. We both scream for him to let her go. Her uncle was on the way to check on us, and he heard us scream. We can see him running towards us. He tackles the guy and tells us to run to the restaurant. We go and tell her mom what happened. Her mom calls the cops, but the guy hit her uncle and got away. The cops never found him and told us if anything else seems suspicious to call them. My husband and I, with our kids, two and four years old, in tow, recently moved to a new city. It wasn't completely new to me, as I had grown up in the surrounding areas. The move was hell with two toddlers, and I knew they must have been having a difficult time. However, my husband and I just wanted to get everything unpacked in the new house before anything else. We made sure to unpack the kids' toys first. After all the unpacking, the kids were beyond restless. We had a hell of a time just keeping them from breaking some of the stuff during unpacking. You know, because kids don't want their toys, they want boxes and anything that isn't theirs. Needless to say, we were all a little restless and a bit agitated. I immediately thought we should take them to the park, meet some other kids from this area, etc. I remember when I was a kid there was a park in town that was just amazing. In memory, it looked like a giant castle, the same size as a two-story house, and had all sorts of extra swings, tire tunnels, etc. I tell my husband and I look up directions, and we get in the car and head off to the park. The closer we get, I start to notice how the neighbors were in some state of disrepair. This area had been hit hard by hurricanes in the early 2000s, and it seemed quite a few had not been able to repair their houses, thus the decline of the neighborhoods. I felt bad to see such a nice area become so broken down, until we had to stop at a red light before the park. An older woman was standing at the bus stop on the other side of the driver's side. Her clothing was a bit ragged, and at first it pulled my heartstrings enough to ask my husband to let down the driver window so I could ask if she needed some water or something. It's hot as hell down here, even in spring, and I've worked with the homeless before. My husband was resisting. While I was thinking I should tell her that she could get free water at most fast food joints, when she starts screaming and pointing directly at us, and saying something about stupid cunt. It was a bit unintelligible, because my husband never actually rolled down the window. Well, of course I'm uncomfortable, but I know a lot of homeless people are mentally unstable, if not worse. I'm with my family, and my husband decides that now is not the time and place for my soft heart to help someone. I agree. Looking back at my kids who completely ignored the scene and were excited about the park they could see, we get to the park, and just like the neighborhood surrounding it, it was crap. My husband and I aren't stupid, and we take turns when going to parks to check the playground equipment and surrounding play area for anything harmful, needles, etc. It might sound like we're paranoid, but I can't tell you how many times we have actually found stuff like crack pipes. Surprisingly, and thankfully, my husband came across nothing so I start explaining the rules to my kids before we get outside. We aren't too overprotective. We want them to have a bit of independence with an eye shot, but they are only two and four. My husband also checks to see if he could see the woman, 
but the bus had stopped and after it left she was no longer there. We get out and we decide we're going to shadow, sounds creepy but just means follow around, the kids today to keep an eye close on them. Well, my son loves the swings, so after a quick game of chase we head for the swings. We were there for a few minutes, counting, talking about the sky and such. I look around to see where my husband and daughter were, when suddenly through one of the tunnels comes that older woman. Well, it scared the shit out of me. She crawled out in a weird way, and she was talking in a raspy voice the entire time. I decide it's time to leave and get my son out to find my daughter and husband. About this playground, the interior of the castle has all of the towers and swing sets with a wooden castle gate surrounding it. Safety for kids since there is a major street right next to the park. So as you guess, we are blocked by this woman who is coming towards the swings with her head bent down, still mumbling. I put myself between my son and her before we pass, and just as we are about to pass, she jerks her head up and begins to scream at us. I scoop my son up, still blocking him from her. I start to run towards the exit. I shout for my husband and feel my shirt being pulled back. Luckily my husband was already coming towards us with my daughter after hearing the scream. Out of instinct, I jerk away and reach for my pocket that has my small pepper spray can and hold it up until we can all get away safely. My husband takes the kids. He knows I know what to do and how to protect myself. I'm facing the parking lot and see my husband has gotten the kids in the car. Luckily she decided to wait for some reason until my kids were out of earshot to threaten my family. She seemed particularly keen on threatening to kill my kids. It was pretty grotesque which internally makes me want to do horrible things to her. However, I stay neutral, refusing to give a reaction. This woman is obviously hostile. I'm gently talking to her, explaining I'm not going to hurt her, and ask if she has any family or if she lives around the area. She completely ignores it and continues on with her incoherent, rambling threats intermingled. I refuse to pepper spray her because she hasn't actually physically hurt me and she is keeping her distance now. My husband apparently called the police because as we were at a standstill for a few minutes, two cruisers pull up. They pull next to my husband who points them in our direction. They come over and take her away. She doesn't even struggle. My husband had to move away at this point so the woman wouldn't be able to see our car as she was being arrested so I wait while they get her in the car. Before she gets in, I see her glance to her left and squint. I come out of the playground with another officer from the other cruiser and see she's looking at her car which is parked by some trees. I look back as they are putting her in and see her mumbling quietly trying to get another view of our car. As I'm giving a statement, I let the officer know my fears about her getting too good of a glimpse of her car. He shrugged, because what can you do, you know, and let me know they'd keep an eye on this park. They reassured me she'd probably be in custody for a while and forget everything. About a month later, the incident wasn't forgotten, but not fresh either. We never go to that park anymore just in case. One day I'm in front of her house with the kids, showing them how to pull weeds from the garden. We're having a good time getting dirty when I hear a woman shouting angrily about a block away. I stand up and staying calm tell the kids we need a water break. We brush off and as we're going inside the yelling gets closer. I turn and look at the crossroad on our street and sure enough it's that woman. Her head is shaved now. That's not terribly important but I can't shake that part. I get the kids inside and she comes to stand by our house in the road. She screams and I barely make out anything. However, I do hear her say she found us now. She won, and now it's her turn. I obviously call the police, but as I'm on the phone, she sprints off. I let the dispatcher know which way she was heading, but refused to go outside and keep watch. An officer arrives to make sure we are safe, 
and stays in our neighborhood until the end of his shift to make sure everything is okay. A week or so passes without incident. I still refuse to bring the kids out front just in case. Our backyard is fenced, so that feels safe enough. The next weekend we are all outside just relaxing when I hear banging on our front door. It was so loud we could hear it from our backyard. My husband takes over at this point, goes inside to grab his gun and check the door. I gather the kids close, but don't go inside just in case there is an altercation. The knocking stops, and I figured my husband is dealing with it. I keep a hold of the kids by telling them a story, when suddenly I see hands above our wooden fence. It appears to be someone jumping up to grab on. I get all of us inside and let my husband know what is going on. I call the cops and he heads out front to the fence. My husband comes in and says she ran off. I knew immediately it was that woman. I asked my husband about it and he confirmed what I thought. He also told me there was thin scratch marks on the door and a puddle of piss on the welcome mat. Lovely. The cops arrive and we give them everything we know, even telling them of the piss-puddled mat. It's been a month without incident now. Hopefully, she's gone for good. This story is 100% true. Even though I was only 8 years old at the time, I can recollect every chilling detail. I moved to a new town. This town was much nicer, cleaner, and quieter than the one I lived at before. Not the sort of town you would expect to have things wrong with it. There was a very big public park right in the center. It housed rows upon rows of swings, slides infested with snake-like tunnels that weaved in and around the playground, providing a maze for children to lose themselves in their games. There was even a functioning merry-go-round, which seemed to always be slightly turning inviting the children to hitch a ride on its platform of twirls. I have to emphasize on the fact that it was a quiet, peaceful town, the kind of town where kids could leave their house on their own and take a short journey to the park. I had been given strict instructions by my parents that I should come home the second it started turning dark. My life was wonderful, or so it seemed. It was a Friday. I knew the day because I remember coming home with a big smile on my face, as I knew I had the luxury of non-stop playing for the next two whole days. I did what I always did. I chucked my school bag on my bed, changed my clothes, and in a matter of minutes, I was ready to descend into a world of fun. Nothing could stop me. The tunnels were my favorite. It was so easy to get lost in them which made great fun for playing hide-and-seek with my only two friends, Billy and Tom. They were both in my class, and we, like many eight-year-olds, loved games that filled us with pure adrenaline. We were going to play murder. I don't expect anyone to know this game. We made it up. The rules were very similar to hide-and-seek, except when the ones seeking found you, they had to murder you. It was only pretend, obviously. It was nearing winter, as I remember being slightly cold as I wormed my way around the tunnels, furiously trying to find a perfect hiding spot. Billy was the seeker. Tom had hidden behind the merry-go-round. I was alone. It must have been maybe ten minutes, which for an eight-year-old felt like a year, when I decided to do what all kids do when they get bored. I give up, I shouted, my voice echoing through the tunnels. I'm in the tunnels. I give up. I then heard shuffling from one end of the tunnel. I don't know why, but I froze still. I didn't call out again. I just waited. Something wasn't right. Billy would always say something before coming in after someone in the tunnel. He would always congratulate them on being the last to be found, or for cheating by hiding in the endless maze of tunnels. As I stood frozen, the shuffling grew louder. I could tell it was starting to get dark outside, as the tunnels began to slowly but surely drop into darkness. I began to slowly shuffle backwards. The shuffling ahead of me grew louder. 
as if someone or something way too big for the tunnel was trying to navigate through them. Come out. It's time to go home now. A very creepy voice echoed through the tunnels. It sounded like when a grown man talks to small children, talking slightly higher pitched. It was definitely wrong. I probably would have came out if the voice was outside, but it wasn't. It was coming from inside the tunnels. Why would an adult crawl inside? I was shuffling further and further back when the face of an old man appeared in the darkness ahead of me. Patches of hair on his head and a definite look of someone who hadn't showered in the last week. I couldn't see what he was wearing, but I knew it was tathered, old clothes. He had a scraggly beard, which was peppered with dirt. The second we made eye contact, he just smiled at me, revealing his filthy unbrushed teeth, which had blotches of brown and black covering them entirely. I panicked. I turned around and began shuffling on all fours as fast as I could, the shuffling behind me growing even louder and quicker. He was chasing me. I sped through the maze for what felt like an eternity. I only stopped when my legs refused to move anymore. I had taken so many twists and turns that even I was completely lost. I don't want to hurt you. I just want to talk. The voice echoed through the tunnels. I could tell he was nearby. I pressed my body against the bottom of the small narrow tunnel and listened. He continued to make soft cooing noises, begging me to come out and present myself to him. I lay in that tunnel for hours. No exaggeration. Even after I heard him curse to himself and angrily force his way out of the tunnel, I continued to wait. Thoughts raced through my mind of me coming out of the tunnel, only to be met by the same smile that once greeted me. In the darkness of the tunnel, I could make out blue flashing lights on the outside. I heard frantic voices calling three names repeatedly. Billy? Tom? Michael? When I heard my name, my heart slowly began to calm. My parents had come. I easily shuffled out of my hiding spot. Guided by the wet dirt scrapings along the walls of the tunnel, the way the man must have gone. Outside, I was greeted by several police cars and lights flashing. There were groups of adults with concerned looks on their faces. I recognized two of them, my parents. Mom, Dad, I wailed, crying as I ran toward them. They began crying and ran towards me, lifting me off the ground and hugging me so tight, it felt as though I was being crushed. Billy and Tom were taken that evening. Their bodies were later found hidden nearby, mutilated. They had been brutally massacred. Their skulls had been caved in with a large iron bar, and their bodies had deep cuts everywhere, large pieces of glass found buried in their backs. What chills me to the fucking bone is that the wet dirt I saw in the tunnels wasn't entirely dirt. Some of it was Billy and Tom's blood. After slaughtering my two best friends and making eye contact with me in that tunnel, he just smiled. He had won the game. About 20 students, myself included, from my university, did a study abroad program in France last summer. We were spending a week in Paris before going to the town where the university was located. Most of the group got a group flight deal to Paris through the university, others flew separately. The only requirement was that we had to be in Paris by the day we had to leave to go to our university. Most of us had arrived by the third day into our Paris trip, except for my friend Amanda. Naturally, we were all worried about her, because her phone wasn't working. She had to update us from Facebook whenever she could get free Wi-Fi, which wasn't very often. Her flight had been delayed about six times already. Another day passed, still nothing from Amanda. We're all freaking out at this point. Since her phone wasn't working, we couldn't even contact her. The fifth day rolls around, still nothing. We all had a scheduled bike tour of the city that morning and a boat ride on the river that afternoon. So we didn't return to the hotel until about seven that evening. When I got in, Amanda was asleep in our room. We were assigned roommates. Of course, 
I woke her up and asked her where the hell she had been. She told me that when she finally got to the airport, she was exhausted and broke. She had multiple layovers and had basically spent all her on-hand cash on food, plus her bank card wasn't working. For those of you unfamiliar with Shao de Gaulle Airport, it is fucking massive. Unless you have a map or understand French completely, you will get lost. So she gets there, lost, broke, tired, hungry, and carrying like three big ass bags, sitting inside the terminal. She said this good looking guy walked up to her and started talking to her in perfect English. You look tired. Do you need a taxi to your hotel? Red flag number one. What taxi driver gets out of this cab and walks into the airport to find a rider? Not thinking, she says, Yes, thank you so much, I'm exhausted. He smiles at her and grabs one of her heavier bags and tells her to follow him. She does, and he leads her to this elevator. Red flag number two. She was already on street level from where all the taxis depart. She gets inside, and he hits the button for the basement level. He gets on the phone before the elevator opens and starts speaking in French, which she couldn't really understand because it was slang. She starts freaking out though when the doors open. It was a service deck meant for employees of the airport or something, not for passenger parking or taxi pickup. It was damp and dark, and as she said, something literally out of a horror movie. The guy gets out of the elevator first and turns to her smiling. Allons-y. Let's go, in French. She takes a few steps and sees, in the far corner of the deck, the trunk of this green, unmarked van with no license plate open and a huge, ugly-ass Middle Eastern guy step out of the driver's seat. At this point, she realizes she's in trouble, but she doesn't want to alert the smiling guy that she's about to get the fuck out of there. There's no one in sight, so screaming would be useless, but the lift door is still open. She quickly placed one of her bags in the middle of the lift entrance and told smiley guy that she needed her wallet that was in the bag that he was carrying. He looks at her sternly for a minute, but walks over to her and hands her the bag. She told me that she pushed him down onto the ground with the weight of the bag and got back onto the elevator as fast as she could. He got up and was bounding after her. She said, Girl, I hit every goddamn button on the elevator panel. The doors closed as soon as he reached her, and she could hear him banging on them as she was going back up to street level. She got to the taxi pickup lane and started bawling. A police officer approached her. She told him what happened, and he drove her to the hotel. On the way, he told her that the men were likely linked to a sex trafficking ring and were approaching young women inside the airport who had tags on their luggage indicating they had come from the United States, assuming that American women were more trusting. I owed my good friend a favor back in high school, so he asked me to pick him up and his mother and little brother from the airport and drive them to their new house one weekend. They had been out of the country for several months and were in the process of moving again, so they rented this piece of shit house in the middle of a really bad neighborhood, which I suppose just served as a place to store their crap. I wait at the airport for them as their flight gets delayed for over three hours. Around the time they land, we pack up their bags and it's almost 4 a.m. I'm exhausted, but I have to drive them to their house about 45 minutes away, then travel another hour back home. I mentally brace myself for a long trip and drank a Red Bull to give me a jolt of energy. As I'm pulling out of the airport parking lot, a small dark blue car pulls behind us. No big deal, I barely noticed it, and it stayed a ways behind. However, I noticed after I've made several wrong turns, none of us had GPS and they were giving me directions from memory, and corrected my course that this car is still cruising, slowly but surely, behind us. I think to myself it's a weird coincidence but took a mental note of it. Eventually we get closer to their neighborhood and thus closer to a really bad part of town. 
We pull up to a red light and I check my rear view mirror. Two men. One had a bigger silhouette and the other kept shaking his head like he was trying to get a crick out of his neck. Now they have my full attention. Why the hell are they still behind me? For some strange reason I'm hoping that this was just a stupid coincidence and my sleep deprived brain is causing me to become paranoid until they followed us into the neighborhood. No fucking way, I say loudly enough to wake my sleeping passengers. I fill them in and they shrug it off, but I'm not taking any chances. Hold on to your butts, I tell them. We pull up to a stop sign and I suddenly gun my SUV. I begin whipping around turns and sure enough they are trying to keep up. I quickly and repeatedly change streets trying to evade them. Another oncoming car causes them to slam their brakes behind me, allowing me to pull ahead and lose sight of them. Once that happens I take a few more turns to lose them, it was a big neighborhood, and pull into a random driveway and kill the engine. A minute later the car comes roaring down the street. The whole family is on edge, now telling me to just head home. I tell them to give it a second. The car comes roaring back down the street, faster than before. I waited until I couldn't see their lights or hear their engine before I turned mine back on and continued to our destination. Many pats on the back from the family. We eventually got to their house and brought all their bags in with no hassle. They were dead tired, but I decided to stay up and watch the house until it was light to make sure that those guys hadn't somehow found my car again. I left around 8am, ready to be back in my bed to sleep. I don't know my friend any more favors. Just this past summer, my younger sister and I went to visit family and friends out of state. My sister at the time was 16 and I'm 18. Just for some reference, my sister and I look very alike, but a lot of the time I get that she looks way older than me, like in her 20s. She's got a good 5 inches on me. Both of us are very loud and obnoxious, especially when we're together. We arrive at the local airport and my parents of course freak out and worry and then send us off. We went to our local airport which is pretty small in comparison to the size of the city we live in. My sister and I find our gate and we had at least an hour before because our flight kept getting delayed due to an emergency landing our plane had to do for someone on board. We were just sitting around, literally off on our own. The airport really isn't big at all. Once you get through security you make a left to where some gates are on our right and to where the other gates are and they have a few shops and restaurants in between these gates. We were at the closest gate possible to where all the restaurants were located and there had to be like three other gates down past us, gate B and C, and obviously we were at A. So we're sitting alone, our flight really didn't have many other people and we were extremely early anyway and there was like a hundred plus other seats, and I'm sitting on the floor charging my phone watching Netflix, and my sister is on a chair next to me doing the same. Some weird older guy just sat right across from us. Mind you, all the other fucking seats around. The dude himself reminded me of the murderer from the lovely bones, except way skinnier, like oddly skinny. So me and my sister are doing small chat in between watching our shows, and we keep hearing the announcements about our flight and we're both cracking jokes and making comments like we always do, just messing around. Almost every single thing we say this guy laughs at. I mean I know when we're together we're pretty funny and he would laugh at things like, do you want water? Or, wow this is taking a while. Like not even remotely a joke. I personally am a very alert person and get paranoid easily especially since I read these stories so often, like I'm always aware of my situation, so I kept my eye on this dude as he kept watching my sister and I, mostly my sister. I'm on the phone watching Netflix when all of a sudden my sister texts me and says, I think this guy is taking pictures of me. I was taken aback and a little shocked. I texted back, are you sure? And she said yes. 
That's when my full crazy sister mode went out. My sister and I are extremely close. I would give my life for her and I don't put up with any shit. Neither does she, and she was very feisty, but I could tell she was scared. As soon as I looked up to give this guy a piece of my mind, he just got up and left. He looked like he was about to shit a ton of bricks. I turned to my sister asking her what happened, and she said she was on the phone and looked up to see him with his phone tilted right at her. I said well maybe he wasn't taking pictures, but she said she could tell just based off the way he was acting, like a teenage girl who's trying to secretly take a picture of a cute boy or something and isn't really being discreet about it. After talking to her about it, I was angry. Who would be taking pictures of a 16 year old girl? I got up and walked down the gates the direction the guy went in. Eventually, I saw him leaning up against the bathroom door next to the men and women's bathroom. I went into the women's bathroom trying to act inconspicuous. I shit you not, as I was entering the bathroom, I peeked at his phone screen and my heart dropped. It was a zoomed in picture of my sister's face. It was unmistakable. He quickly looked up to make eye contact with me, stashed his phone in his pocket and darted into the men's bathroom. I immediately returned to my sister. I told my sister and we immediately texted our mother who freaked the fuck out, telling us to inform the employees there and to find a security guard. We continued to wait for him to return from the bathroom, but he didn't, so we held off from telling security. The weirdest part besides him taking pictures was when me and my sister boarded the flight. The man did not. He didn't return to our gate and wasn't even on our flight, so he was just sitting across from us taking pictures of us for literally no other reason than being a weirdo. In May, I was going on a trip to Jacksonville, Florida. We had to stop in the Twin Cities. So while we, my grandparents and I were waiting for three hours, I decided to go and get pizza and tea. Now, I'm not familiar with the Twin Cities airport, mainly because all the times I've been there, I was fairly young. I ordered a tea from this kiosk-looking thing and a piece of Hawaiian pizza from the place in front of it. I sat down to eat and got out my phone and decided to check my email and go on Tumblr. About 10 minutes afterwards, some guy who sort of looked like Shaggy from the live-action Scooby-Doo movie comes and sits down in the seat in front of me, just staring at me. I told him to mind his own business and he just said, I, I just can't help it. You're so beautiful and I would love to show you around. I told him that I was a minor. His response? No one has to find out. Come on. I have a dog you can have. After that sentence, I ran off into the nearest washroom and thought about what to do. Maybe he won't realize I ran into the washroom, I thought to myself. I can just go tell my grandma about what happened and she'll ruin him. Needless to say, I thought wrong. I walked out of the washroom only to be greeted with that nasty hippie face of his. Where did you go? Come on, mom's worried about you. I told him I didn't know what he was talking about. Oh, don't be silly, my darling little sister. Mom's waiting for us. Come on. I realized what he was doing, and so I decided that the best thing to do was scream and say, Get the fuck away from me. He gestured for me to quiet down. I stomped on his foot and ran off. I immediately informed security and they escorted him out of the airport. So I'm a 20 year old male and I flew to India last November to meet a few family members. It was my first time flying on my own to India and despite what family would tell me, I wasn't at all worried since I can speak and understand Hindi, although quite badly. Also, I looked like I could pass for an Indian which I thought would help me blend in. I landed at around 2am and after landing at Mumbai International Airport, 
I had to catch a quick airport coach to take me from the international to the domestic airport. Standard procedure, although I found it a bit strange for such a busy airport to have such a system, I managed to make my way onto the coach. Now I know you must be thinking that the coach must be fake, but it wasn't the coach. I managed to get to the domestic airport just fine, and as I was waiting to disembark, I saw some people dressed in airport gear checking people's boarding passes. So, I held my pass to show the guy, and as he looked at it he gave a perplexed look. He scanned my pass again and stated that my flight wasn't due to depart for 4 hours. This is true, but I thought I'd chill at the airport anyway. He said that I'd have to take a taxi and go back to the international airport as they would not let me go into the domestic unless the departure was less than 2 hours. I obviously wasn't going to pay for a taxi back to the airport and didn't understand why the airport wouldn't let me in. However, after thinking about all the weird procedures Indian airports have had so far, such as having to collect my bags at Mumbai airport and check them back in the same place, disorganized queuing everywhere, get a damn coach to and from the same airport, and the dim lights of the domestic terminal, I thought this may be another one of its irritating quirks. I agreed with the guy and walked with him to the car park. He was asking me where I was from and what I was doing in India, just some friendly banter I thought, but I was too tired and shy to even attempt to speak to him in Hindi. I kept telling him I'm not paying for the taxi and that I have no money on me just to make sure he wasn't going to scam me. He kept nodding and took me to the taxi he said I should take. Now, from watching Bollywood films, I know how Mumbai taxis look. They're yellow and black and are a distinctive model. This taxi was a normal silver colored car with not even an ounce of credibility to pass as a taxi in Mumbai. Surrounding the taxi were a bunch of eerie looking guys, all looking at me with a straight face. Feeling a bit awry, I backed away a bit while they were talking to one another. Thankfully, the guy who led me to them didn't know I could speak Hindi and they were saying stuff like, He's some sweet goods. We'll have fun with him. You brought a good one. I'll be sure not to let him go. Aghast, I started sweating and shaking. I know people back home have said I act a bit camp and apparently unintentionally act flirtatious, but I had no idea that a bunch of Indian guys would have any interest in me apart from maybe getting some money. Visibly shaken, I was completely speechless and had no idea how to get out of the situation. The guy had my boarding pass and the car door was open. Then I had an idea. I said to the guy in English, Can I just quickly buy a coffee? I've been parched for so long. He stated that the police at the door of the airport wouldn't let me in no matter how much I tried and the best thing was to get into the car. I insisted that I just try to get in as I was really thirsty and my voice started croaking, out of fear originally, but thankfully it could be passed as thirst. His friends told him to give me my boarding pass back and let me try it out. He gave it back and made me promise I'd come back after the coffee. I obviously obliged and gave him a cute smile as I snatched the pass and power walked it to the terminal. Of course, I didn't want to act too alarmed as they could have easily ran up to me and tackled me, in addition, the police could have been in cohorts with them and refused me access. Thank you Indian News. So I made my way to the terminal and showed the policeman my boarding pass. He had a look and I asked him if I was allowed to enter the terminal just to make sure. He said, Of course, your flight departs from here. And directed me to the departure's lounge. I've never felt so thankful in my life. I breathed a sigh of relief as I hightailed it up to the escalator and passed the security check to make sure the gang wouldn't be let in. It was about 4am at this point and all I could think of was what would have happened if I couldn't understand Hindi and went into the taxi. To this day I shudder at the thought. My only regret is not informing the police when I was let in. I think nerves did get the better of me and I felt distrust towards everyone. Plus, Indian police officers wouldn't have done much to help the situation, probably would have told me to keep calm and carry on.
In January, I went to Washington, D.C. with some very close family friends. Coming from a town of about 11,000 people and never having been to a city even close to D.C.'s size, I was scared out of my mind that I'd get pickpocketed or mugged or something. TV had led me to believe that big cities like this had absolutely packed streets that were difficult to walk on, resulting in regular occurrences such as these. Needless to say, I was relieved when the trip ended without any such incident. At the DC airport, our 6 a.m. flight was delayed three or four times due to weather. By the time we finally got to the Denver, Colorado airport, it was around midnight preventing us from driving the rest of the way home that night as we had originally planned. I refused to pee on airplanes unless absolutely necessary, so when we landed, I had to go. So I, along with my friend's mom who also had to go, went to the restroom. When I came out of the stall, I noticed the security lady was now standing beside the door. I had heard no other footsteps come in the completely empty restroom. My ears were actually quite alert because the empty airport freaked me out, so this confused me a bit, but I just smiled at her and washed my hands. Approximately 10 seconds later, a toilet flushed. Instead of my friend's mom, a creepy looking man with a black sweatshirt on, hood up, emerged from the stall. At the sight of the airport employee, he lowered his head and quickly walked out of the restroom. She followed him out, saying, this is clearly marked a woman's restroom. At the time, probably most due to sleep deprivation, I didn't think much of it. But the next day it really dawned on me. A man wearing a black sweatshirt with the hood up in a woman's restroom, which was marked as such with quite an enormous sign. It's midnight and the airport is practically deserted. Plus he entered the restroom without a single sound, which for me was the worst part. I don't recall hearing any footsteps or extra sounds of urination or anything like that, so I honestly don't think he even used the restroom at all, rather just pretended by flushing the toilet. I repeatedly mentally thanked that security guard for seeing this. I very well could have been kidnapped, murdered, raped, who knows. He easily could have jumped me. I hadn't even looked up until the security guard spoke to him. But the second I did, I got a very creepy vibe from him, and he very notably tried to avoid making eye contact. I have to preface this story by saying I was a really smart kid when I was little. At 18 months, I knew every word to the bare necessities from the Jungle Book and would perform it for my mom's co-workers. I don't think anyone ever taught me what to do in a situation with a stranger, just not to talk to them. I also have to say that when I was little, around three to four, my mom let me cut my hair really short, like a boy's, and everyone mistook me for one because I refused to wear anything girly. Also, like small children, I wasn't a good listener. For some reason, my grandma took me to the airport with her one day when she was watching me. I can't remember if my parents had gone out of town or if we were picking up someone else and she had to bring me because it was her day to watch me while my parents were at work. Regardless, this was before security in the airports were super tight, so we were headed to a gate to pick whoever it was up. Or maybe we were just getting out in the main airport and it seemed like we were headed to a gate because I was so much smaller so everything seemed bigger. Forgive the lack of memory, I was little. I do distinctly remember, however, that my grandma scolded me for running ahead of her and told me not to do it again. Five minutes later, I'm at it again. I ran down a small flight of stairs, maybe three or four steps at most, and was suddenly swooped up by a very large man. I remembered that he smelled funny and that he had a really scraggly beard and blonde hair and really creepy eyes. He then starts to rush off with me, and I remember being very calm about the whole thing because, in my mind, my grandma was right there, and she wouldn't let anyone hurt me. Well, she came tearing after this guy, faster than I've ever seen her move, and she's yelling at him to put me down and whacking at him with her purse, and he said to her, Lady, chill. 
This is my son. The kid you're looking for must have ran off. That's when little old me pipes up and says, I am not a boy, and you are not my daddy. Now put me down. The guy looks shocked out of his mind and slightly repulsed and promptly put me down and ran off. Now, my whole family has talked this story to death. Is it possible this guy really thought I was his son? Was he just someone who made a mistake? Or was he a pedophile who thought he had scooped up a little boy? As a whole, we tend to lean toward pedophile mostly because of his behavior. He didn't say a word to me, just picked me up and tried to hurry off. And then when it became clear I was a girl, he hightailed it out of there as fast as he could. If he was just a man who made a simple mistake, he probably would have stuck around and apologized to my grandma for frightening her and for snatching me. I'm a 20-year-old female and this took place back in March. I was 19 years old at the time. It was the end of spring break and I was returning to Texas from California. I had just spent my vacation with my sister who lives in San Francisco. Every college kid counts down the days until spring break and my vacation had gone rather well. However, I was slightly okay with returning to the essays and research papers because I miss my friends, my bed, and my cat, maybe not in that particular order. I was flying alone, something I don't like doing for multiple reasons, and had only one layover in Dallas. I don't like traveling alone because I've had some bad experiences, and I happen to look a lot younger than 20. Most often, people say I look 13 or 14 at the most. I've always hated this about myself, but I'm told I'll be grateful when I'm older. As of now, it's just immensely frustrating. The last time I was on a plane by myself, the attendant thought I was an unaccompanied minor named Taylor. I quickly assured her I was not the minor in question. The time before that, I was asked to move away from the emergency exit because you have to be at least 16 to sit there. Anyways, my boyfriend was picking me up from the airport and I was excited. I wore the pink members-only jacket he had bought for me and tried to look my best, which is difficult to do when traveling. When the plane arrived in Dallas, we had some really terrible weather and the turbulence was scary. But no matter, soon I would be on another flight to Houston. I took the train around to the sea terminal and made my way to the gate, only to find that, due to the torrential rain and lightning, my flight had been cancelled. I was crushed, but determined. I took my ticket to be exchanged for a later flight. It seemed many others had the same grievance and were opting to do the same. As I was standing in line, a friendly looking older man came up to me and stood behind me. Are you alone? He asked me. Everyone seemed to be conversing with one another, complaining about the weather and pondering their options to get home. It didn't seem like a big deal because strangers always seem to connect in situations like this one. We were all frustrated. I also felt safe in the crowded airport, so I answered him truthfully and continued to wait in the line. The man behind the counter said I was in luck, that there was only two seats left on another flight to Houston and that I could make it if I hurried. I rushed aboard the train to the A terminal to catch my new flight and upon reaching the gate was faced with the same situation. This new flight was cancelled too. The man from before had followed me to the gate and was in the same boat. I exchanged my ticket for a later flight and resolutely marched myself to the new gate only to be told the same as before. This happened literally two or three more times because I didn't want to give up and really had no other options. The man shadowed me during the entire ordeal and I didn't really find it strange. We were just two individuals stranded in an airport. The last gate I went to, I noticed he was still following me. He walks over to me and begins to chat about what awful luck we were having. Someone eavesdropping nearby suggests that I rent a car. I politely tell them that I am not old enough. The man smiles and says to me, Well, I'm old enough to rent a car. How about this? I'll rent us one. 
You can sleep, and I'll drive. I look at him, and the way he is staring at me scares me. I finally begin to feel that something is off. I respond, Uh, no, but thank you. I'm going pretty far off. His smile falters for a moment. Then he suggests that he buy me some food. I am starving. I am tempted. I hesitate for a moment, but then I remember a book I had read about a girl who was stolen from the airport after a man drugs her coffee. This gives me the strength to deny my grumbling stomach and decline him again. He follows me. I don't know why. He's already told me he's going to rent a car and leave. He points to a Mexican restaurant and says, Oh, how about that place? He has this strange look on his face and is standing far too close to me. I shake my head and said, I told you, I'm really not hungry. Lie, big lie. I can smell something delicious and I almost give in. But my face does not betray my hunger and I keep my pace. Okay, okay, uh, what about burgers then? He looks a bit annoyed. This guy doesn't give up easy. I ignore him. This causes him to glare at me angrily and then stalk away. I breathe a sigh of relief. I call my sister to tell her about him. Not in a catty sort of way, just a, wow, that guy was persistent kind of thing. I sit onto a chair to think about my options. I feel pretty alone and worried. My latest ticket had me leaving at around midnight, and it was 9 p.m. at this point. I had been in the airport since 5 p.m. If this last flight didn't work out, I had no clue what I would do. I had no money for a hotel and didn't fancy sleeping in a chair. The last time I fell asleep in public, on a train in France, a lady attempted to steal my backpack, but that's another story. I look up about 30 minutes later to see the same man walking towards me. I tuck my legs up in my chair nervously and pretend to play on my phone. Hey there. Still here? He asks. He seems to have cooled down. I just stare at him. He clears his throat and tries again. So I was thinking you could come stay at my aunt's house for the night. With me. That's where I'm staying tonight. It would be no problem. You don't want to be in this airport all night, all alone. I shake my head and say, No, I'm fine. Then turn my attention back to my phone. I didn't even make eye contact. I felt really uncomfortable. He tries to convince me, and I have to say no firmly several more times. He looks angry, really angry. His hands are clenched and his smile is obviously fake. It looks as if he will shatter his teeth if he clenches his jaw any tighter. I wonder to myself why he hasn't left the airport yet. Then I notice that his luggage is no longer with him. He was rolling it behind him, and now he isn't. Where would he have put it if he hadn't left yet? And so much time has passed. Why is he back here? As I'm thinking all of this, he is just standing there, staring. After what feels like forever, he storms off again. I feel so anxious because of him that I grab my things and move to a different gate to wait. My phone was dying, and I didn't want to be without it, so to charge it I have to plug it into the outlet in the floor. I curled up in the aisle between the chairs to wait. My sister called about an hour later, and I was telling her about how creepy the dark weather looked outside. When I see him, again walking around, glancing here and there, in search of me. I hunched down even further, but my pink jacket was like a beacon. He locked eyes at me, and I looked down. My sister said to stay on the phone, so I did. Well, there you are, he says, not even acknowledging that I am in the middle of a phone call. I continue talking to my sister. When it becomes apparent that he isn't leaving and doesn't care that I'm on the phone, I finally look up. So you're still here. Look, you need to come with me. You can stay with me at my grandparents tonight. They would love to have you. They don't mind me bringing you at all. Just come with me. 
I got chills. I don't know why, but something in his eyes told me he was lying. Lying through those shiny white teeth of his. You said you were staying with your aunt. His face dropped. It went from cool and collected to something else. Not even anger this time, and not defeat either. Almost like amusement. Something like the cat that ate the canary. He shrugs his shoulders like, I tried. But we both recognize that he was caught in his lie. The entire time my sister is saying, hello, repeatedly. But I was sort of shocked by how indifferent he was to me catching on to him. I go back to my conversation and he says, If you change your mind. And lets the thought trail off while walking away backwards, eyes still on me. I call my boyfriend and tell him about each exchange, and he tells me to find a security guard to tell. I look around for one, but couldn't find one. It was creepy because I've never seen an airport so deserted. I end up just deciding to move again and lay down between two different aisles, out of view. A boy my age walks by and asks, Why are you laying on the floor? And I respond a tad aggressively with, Because I want to. He laughs and puts his hand up, the unspoken sign for, Whoa, take it easy. I apologize for my gruffness and tell them that a man was making me nervous. He jokingly says he'll protect me, and because he seems harmless and I mention my boyfriend, I converse with him for a while. He tells me he saw me and wondered why the blonde girl looked so sad. A little while later, I am thankful I didn't brush off this stranger because I see the man again walking around. We made eye contact, but he didn't attempt to approach me because I was no longer alone. Maybe it was just some middle-aged man trying his luck at getting a girlfriend or something but scaring someone isn't the way to do it. Even if he meant me absolutely no harm, he was too aggressive and angry. The fall semester of my junior year of university was spent studying abroad with my best friend in Florence. We had a blast exploring the city, checking out timeless works of art, partying every night, making new friends and traveling the country. Before we knew it, four months had gone by and we were on the way to the airport for our flight home. The night before saw a huge snowstorm, something that is rare for Italy. The white covered city sparkled divinely as we drove through, and I remember feeling incredibly bummed to be going home. Even though it was five days before Christmas and I missed my family, I wanted nothing more than to stay in Florence forever. That feeling lasted all of 20 minutes. The airport was complete chaos, and upon entering we discovered that our flight had been cancelled. Cue the waterworks for my friend for the duration of roughly 13 hours. Yes, 7am to 8.30pm. We spent in line to try to get on another flight. Finally, we were given tickets for a new flight, but that flight was leaving from Rome in three days. Since we handed in our keys to our apartment and all of our other friends had flown home the day before, we were completely stranded. My friend was a complete wreck at this point, terrified at the idea that we might not make it back for Christmas and was really no help in deciding what we should do. So. I decided the best course of action would be to hop on a train to Rome and spend the next couple of nights in the airport. After seven exhausting hours on the train, we finally made it into the Rome airport and tried to find a corner to claim and bed down in for the coming two nights. We found a small area between a handicap ramp and the wall. The railing for the ramp created a sort of barrier and it made a nice, seemingly safe nook for us to squeeze ourselves into. Exhausted, we pushed our luggage into the back of the nook and lay our backs against them. After making sure my friend was okay, I covered myself with my jacket and promptly fell asleep. I awoke to the feeling of a tug on my foot, and thinking that someone had accidentally kicked my shoe while passing by, I shrugged it off and snuggled deeper into my jacket. 
Not three seconds later, I hear a man whisper, American. American. I felt the tug on my foot again. I jump to my feet and see my best friend with her jacket on and her luggage by her side standing next to a very handsome Italian man. He had salt and pepper hair and was wearing a dark suit with a champagne colored tie. His mouth formed a dazzling smile, but his eyes weren't smiling with it. I looked at my friend quizzically, trying to figure out what was going on and why she was standing with him. Looking back at him, I noticed that he was glancing to his sides and at the guard near the exit about 40 feet from where we were standing. His behavior immediately set off alarms in my head and I grabbed my friend's arm to pull her back away from him. He grabbed her other arm and started talking very fast, saying that he worked for the airport and the flights out of Rome were all going to be cancelled shortly, that he had a car and he could drive us to Naples and we could get a flight out of there. He said that my American friend had agreed to come with him and that I should too. American, it is safe with me. I glared at my friend and told him in Italian that we were not interested in his offer and that we would wait for our flight. With my hand still firmly gripping my friend's arm, I grabbed my stuff and made a walk away from the creep. He immediately moved into my way, blocking us into the nook. His eyes, with no semblance of humanity, fixed onto mine as he said, American, you are coming with me. Being cornered is a strange feeling, and prior to this instance it had never happened to me before. My reaction was immediate and it felt raw, animalistic, full of rage, or terror, or both. I lunged at this man, shoving both of my fists into his stomach. It definitely surprised him and definitely knocked the wind out of him because his knees buckled and he toppled to the floor, bringing my friend down with him. As soon as they hit the ground, my friend began screaming and the man scrambled to get up and away from us, but not before the security guard by the door got to him. In my adrenaline-filled state, I began repeating, He's trying to take us! He's trying to take us! As the security guard knelt on the guy's back, keeping him there until other guards could assist him. When the man was secured, they left him off of the ground to bring him to what I assume was the detainment room of the airport. As they lifted him, he looked directly at me with his empty eyes and fake smiled and whispered, See you soon, American. As soon as he was out of my sight, I broke down sobbing. I was so exhausted and terrified and incredibly angry at the fact that my friend had agreed to go with this man, that she had thought it was a good plan to get into a car with this person that she had never met and that she had put us in an extremely dangerous situation. When I confronted her about it, her only excuse was that she wanted to make it home in time for Christmas, if she had gone with him. I don't think she would have ever made it home for another Christmas. I was living in Austin, Texas at the time, but had flown out to Los Angeles for the weekend. My friends put on a yearly music festival at a biker bar out around Joshua Tree, just a relatively small town thing compared to Coachella and the like that is, where most of the attendees are also musicians and everyone knows each other. So we drink, heavily, for three days or so. By the end of it, you tend to need at least a week to recover. So I was flying back to Texas, wildly hungover and miserable and completely drained. I had a flight from LA to Dallas, then a quick hop to Austin from there. I was seated by the window, on the left side where there were only two seats. Seated in the aisle seat was a middle-aged woman, totally unremarkable, just your average Texan mom. We made polite small talk for a few minutes but I really felt like doing nothing but curling up in a ball against the wall and passing out. So shortly after takeoff, I put in my headphones and start watching a movie on my iPod until I fell asleep. Throughout the movie, I thought I noticed her trying to look over my shoulder and watch the movie too, and then mumbling something like, Oh great, just ignore me. This happened several times, but I convinced myself I was just misreading her. 
Eventually, I noticed her furiously scribbling writing in the margins of a beat-up leather-bound book. I kept peeking over to see it, seeing that the entire book was filled with unintelligible chicken scratch in pretty much every bit of available space in the margins. I also noticed it was an Alcoholics Anonymous book. Whatever, I thought. Just someone with some issues. I eventually fell asleep. Wake up, landing in Dallas. People start getting off the plane. The lady makes zero effort to start packing her things up or getting ready to go. She keeps sitting there scribbling in her book. As I said, I am wildly hungover and kind of cranky and have no patience for anything that's prolonging the time I have to spend on an airplane. It gets to our row, and it's her turn to move into the aisle, and again she doesn't move at all. The rows behind us now start to leave. I finally say, Hey, I've got a connection to catch, so I have to get moving here. Gesturing towards the aisle and standing up, she laughs, shakes her head, looks at me and goes, Oh, no, no. You aren't going anywhere. I was so confused. My mind was now at its sharpest that day. I responded with, I assure you, I am going somewhere. I'm getting off this plane now. She shook her head again and said, But you promised me you'd never leave me. Now other people who are leaving the plane are looking at this exchange also baffled, and I make eye contact with a few people giving that can you believe this look before edging shoving my way out of the row saying nope <laughs> nope I certainly never said that I'm leaving now as I edge past she sighed and so well I guess I gotta go with you then at which point she stands up behind me leaving her purse and book and all her belongings on the plane and follows me out all through the tunnel and through the terminal and up the escalator, this woman follows at my heels, grinning like a mad woman the entire time. I'm walking fast, but she is right on my heels. I didn't say anything at first, and my mind kept saying, why is this happening now, of all days? I just did not want to deal with whatever the hell breakdown this woman was having, not with the way I was feeling eventually getting to the waiting area for the monorail to the next terminal where my connecting flight is, and she saddles up right next to me, still grinning. At this point I say, Alright, seriously, why are you following me like this? Her response this time, Because I love you, and you promised me you would never be apart from me. I laughed nervously, and looked around at the strangers also waiting for the train, making sure I loudly announced, No, I did not promise that. I have no idea who you are. The train arrives. I get on. She obviously follows. Now she's trying to hold my hand. I'm moving around the monorail car, texting the girl I was seeing at the time about what is going on and how I'm actually kind of terrified by this woman. My phone was at 1% though and died before I could get a response. I was actually getting severely creeped out by this woman. Her eyes were completely vacant. There was just nothing but emptiness in her stare. She didn't blink. Coupled with her unyielding grin, I was becoming sure it was only a matter of time before she snapped and proceeded to stab me or shove me down an escalator or something. She's still grabbing at my hand and following me as I shove around the tiny train car and I announce to the other strangers, I have no idea who this woman is. Seriously, can anyone get a hold of security or something? But everyone responded with silence. Nobody else wanted to deal with this either. I felt like I was the crazy one now too, making random statements to a train full of strangers. We finally get to the other terminal. I near run to my gate, with her right behind me still, still saying things like, you can't get away from me this time. I get to the gate and spend a moment scanning the crowd. I see a woman in what looked like a police uniform waiting and said, Excuse me, are you security or police or... See, this lady. But she just shakes her head at me. 
everyone in the crowd just does their best to ignore us. You would be amazed at how hard it is to find security or police in a damned airport these days when you really need them. Finally, I go up to the desk and shamelessly interrupt the agent standing there. Doing my best to maintain composure, I put on a half smile and explain to them, Hi there. So this woman standing right next to me here, I have no idea who she is, and she has been following me for quite some time. Both the agents laugh. The male one makes a comment like, Oh, long vacation, huh? Yep, yep. Seriously, what can I help you with? The crazy lady laughed with them, rolling her eyes at my absurd assertion that I didn't know her. I chuckled, shook my head and said, No, I mean it. I have no idea who this woman is. They finally saw the desperation in my eyes and the seriousness of my tone, and their smiles faded. Uh, can we see your boarding passes? I handed him mine. She produced hers from her pocket as I continued explaining, She was on my previous flight. She even left her purse on that plane, all the way in the other terminal. The agents speak with themselves off to the side for a moment, while I completely ignore the woman, just swatting away at her hand as she tries to hold mine for the hundredth time. The agents make a few quick hush calls, and then come back over and just say, Come with me. They immediately whisk me through the door and slam it on my pursuer, and I'm loaded onto the plane about ten minutes before any other passenger, as a stream of staff filters by, each one offering a new apology. Eventually the rest of the passengers get on, and they all shoot me glances as they pass my row, some of sympathy, some of sheer confusion. The man who sits behind me asks, Hey man, what was that? I give him the brief version, and he tells me, She had a complete and total meltdown the second you got on the plane, screaming, tearing her hair out, pounding her feet. They took her away in handcuffs. You really didn't know her? Nope, I didn't. To this day, I still wonder all the time what the hell was going on with that woman. I barely even have told this story to many of my friends, because it's just so unbelievable. I never received any other information about the incident, never learned who she was or why she thought I promised her anything, let alone eternal companionship and love.